What's up, everybody? It's uh, another Friday night, uh, and it's the second Friday of the month, and so y'all know what that means. It means that it's time for another meeting of the Astronomical Society of Southeast Texas. Uh, it is indeed Friday, September 11th, 2020, uh, and we're going to do some astronomy. We're going to have some fun. We're going to give you guys the state of our club, uh, as it were, and uh, so if you're a member of the Astronomical Society of Southeast Texas, Put it down in the comments, which are whatever way they are. I don't even know what, what depends on what platform you're watching. But I'm going to get to all y'all's comments as much as I can. And uh, we're going to hang out. We're going to have some fun. We're going to have a very fun night of astronomy and good times. we got an awesome panel of experts here. Most of the people <laughs> above me are experts on things that I have no idea about. Um, yeah, J Jane Miner is an expert at operating a 12-inch telescope, a Mead 12-inch so. Now, I guess we'll just point at each other, but we're all here. We're all here. It is great to see uh, David in the chat room with us. Uh, Mr. Terry B. from right here in Beaumont. Welcome, Terry. David says, hey. Uh, Adam, I think it's Adam Corville. What's up, Adam? Hey, guys, he says. What's up, David? Good to see you, brother. Good to see you, man. Steve Olson in the house from Venus, Texas, which is the coolest Texas town, I think, ever. Uh, there are some cool Texas towns, but Venus, Texas, let's get real. That's pretty cool. TJ's in the house. Uh, there's Kat. Hey, we all know Kat. Usually she's up here somewhere yeah. in, this, in this general area right here. But right now she's down here, which is hilarious. we got to figure out which way we're pointing here. Uh, <laughs> Craig Hughes says, yee-haw. That's how we should have opened the meeting. I, I, in hindsight now, I feel bad that I didn't open it that way. Uh, Carl Dunn, member of our club over there in Houston, says hello, uh, Will, Eddie, Howard, Cosmos Carl here. Well, there he is. <laughs> there he is. Uh, Dakota Hillard's in the house. And Lori Sell. Good to see you, Lori. Um, good to have all y'all in the house. We're going to get to some more comments and, and viewer questions. If y'all have questions, please you know, throw them down at all, at all times. We can, uh, we'll catch them as long as they're uh, you know, on the YouTube or the Facebook. We should see them. Um, so I'm going to get to the intro so we can get rolling here. We've got, uh, not a long meeting tonight, but I think it's going to be jam packed, uh, with fun stuff. So, uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. But first on my screen, top left, <coughs> which I think is, did I get right? Top left, which is right for me. It's, it's weird. Mr. Eddie Trevino with the infinity stones and all, how you doing, Eddie? <laughs> Hello, Will. How's everybody tonight? It's good to be here. Thanks for uh, including me and I'm excited about tonight's meeting. We got yeah. some cool weather, and it looks like the skies are finally starting to clear. Ooh, yeah, I bet it is nice up there in central Texas because y'all took all the cold for, <laughs> from us. Like, we got nothing down here. In fact, we got all the humidity and nonsense. So yeah. I, I'm glad you're cooling off, Eddie. I'm jealous. I'm super, super <laughs> jealous. I'm super jealous. But it's great to have you, Eddie. It's all, always good to see you, you, man. Thank you. And then Howard and Jane Miner here, uh, two of my favorite amateur astronomers on the planet. Uh, did the cold weather make it to you guys, Howard, or uh, y'all still in the heat over there as well as we are? Well, I think it stalled out right across the street from us. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't quite get in here, but I'll tell you what, we did have a nice morning this morning, and Jane and I sat out on the patio drinking our coffee and... Uh, just about every morning, actually. Yeah, but this was <laughs> special this morning. It was our coolest morning, like the cold front our weatherman has been <laughs> predicting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so anyway, we're uh, doing fine over here in Conroe and area. We're about 12 miles or so, a little bit southwest of Conroe. And yeah. everything's fine with us. And welcome to the club. Hopefully we have a lot of members watching. Glad to be here. Yeah, and it's yeah. great. To, it's great to see Jane. Uh, you know, if, if you're a member of the Astronomical Society of Southeast Texas, then you, you're very familiar with everyone above me. Probably not me so much, but everyone above me for sure. And uh, you know, we've seen Jane in the background before, but now we actually have Jane where we can ask her questions. So, Jane, thank you for <laughs> thank you for coming and being with us and hanging out with us. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> Well, any any questions y'all need as far as astrophysics, mathematics, uh, calculus, trigonometry, <laughs> all those can be directed at Jane Miner herself. Uh, I'll give y'all the email here at the end of the show, and uh, we can get those questions answered for y'all as as quick as we can. But it's great to have you guys. I, I love having the miners 
uh, on here on the show with us. It's it's, it's just awesome. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, good to be here. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we uh, we got even more people joining in now. That's why I kind of like to, you know, take a little bit longer with the intros sometimes uh, so everybody can kind of get in. Ian is in the house now. Gary says, thanks, Will. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining, Gary. We appreciate you hanging out with us. The Courtney Project. No one knows who that is, but I, I bet you I bet you some of us might know who that is. Yeah, that's yeah. that's Courtney Young. That's the wifey, I guess. How you doing, Courtney? Hi, Courtney. Courtney. <laughs> And uh, yay, Howard's editor is here. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Howard is our newsletter editor, but there is also an editor in chief uh, for that process as well. And that's Mrs. Jane Miner up there. So uh, we can thank her for all the fun in the uh, in the uh, in the newsletter. Carl says it's my fault. We've had bad skies. Thanks, Carl, for taking the blame. I was given an eight inch Mead LX XL 90. Uh, and a bunch of equipment for free through a generous donation. Wow. Plenty to use it for the first time tonight. There you go. So at wow. least the, the skies are clear tonight, Carl. So that's good. That's great news, man. And that's what what an awesome a ninety millimeter uh, meat. I guess that's what a is that a max like like cast grain? Yeah, a cast or, yeah, yeah. One of those. It's a catadioptric of some kind. Uh, so that'll be yeah. fun, Carl. Yeah, you don't have to collimate it, which is always fun. It's always um, good to be associated with NASA. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You get all the cool toys if you know if you know NASA people. So, and we know Carl. So, yeah. I don't know. I don't know where that gets us, but maybe it gets us uh, a <laughs> cup of coffee. But I have my coffee here. I don't know if you guys have your coffee. Uh, but um, we're gonna get started with the meeting, and uh, we've got some fun stuff to talk about tonight. And uh, we'll go ahead and just jump into it, I guess. I'll move us all over to the side. And uh, there it is. There's how we normally open our meetings. Uh, normally, this, this slide is up on the screen for about 30 minutes, and people are tired of it. But uh, there it is. I'll let you guys look at it for another couple seconds. And uh, considering what today is, uh, I figured we could uh, you know, just take a moment to remember – what happened 19 years ago, uh, which I know that all of us uh, on this panel and in the crowd tonight know exactly where we were uh, the moment that all that happened. Um, and um, we won't do a moment of silence because, you know, we, we all know, we all remember, uh, we will never forget as the saying goes, correct? Um, and, you know, what I want to do is uh, send a huge uh, appreciation and thank you out to the first responders, people like Kat Trevino, uh, who who are on the front lines of this COVID crisis, uh, then the men and women who are firemen, you know, uh, EMS, doctors, nurses, everybody on the front lines there, and then everybody on the front lines for us as a country, serving our country in whatever military branch you choose. They're all awesome, um, and they're all fantastic. And um, so I just wanted the you know just quick second here at the beginning of our meeting to remember. Uh, the almost 3,000 people that died on September 11, 2001, uh, in a senseless way. And, um, you know, we're here, us Americans are here continually to, uh, to stand as a monument to them. Um, and so, again, thank you to all those of you who are on the front lines. And um, I guess, it, it, Eddie, uh, Howard, y'all have any words y'all want to say real quick on that? I, I've got nothing to add, Will. It was a very sad day, and it, uh, it's hard to remember it, but we have to remember it. Absolutely. Yeah, Jane and I were um, watching the Today program back then in the, in the morning, and the first plane crashed into the first building. And uh, so anyway. Uh, it showed it instantly. Yeah, I mean, pretty much just right after it, they panned right over from NBC to – show it and then you know i don't can't remember how long it was till the next one but we were actually still watching when the second plane plunged in through the building and uh, it was certainly a, a devastating moment moment for us and uh, and it changed the world forever and that's a great point howard is that it it brought up out something you know people have talked about 2020 how it's a horrible year it's really been a year of change ultimately is, is whatever way you want to put it. 
Uh, and that day was a, a day of change for sure. I mean, the whole world changed uh, as we were watching it live on TV. Uh, the way we travel, you know, the way we, um, the way New Yorkers, New York, <laughs> if that's a verb at all. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to take a quick, I don't think we've ever had an astronomy meeting on uh, September 11th that I can remember. So I figured it would take a, we'd take a second um, to remember and to say thank you to all those who, uh, you know, went in and helped try to save lives uh, during that event. So our hats off to you for sure. And we appreciate y'all. So, uh, and Adam Corville says, I was working in Port Arthur the day it happened. We got the announcement over the PA from our manager. Yeah, I was in, um, I was waking up for an 8 a.m. class, uh, English, uh, in college. And when I got to class, they basically sent everyone home. But I'll never forget that, waking up with my parents and kind of watching all that go down. It was uh, pretty, pretty crazy times. But um, now that now that we've uh, we've remembered, we'll uh, we'll just continue on with our meeting here and uh, try to remember why we uh, why we try to have fun, I guess. Right. So visitors, I know I've recognized a bunch of visitors and uh, Jane's kind of a visitor with us tonight because, you know, she hasn't really joined us before. So we'll recognize Jane, <laughs> our first visitor there, even though she's a member of the club. But there she yeah. is. <laughs> and if you are a visitor uh, of the club tonight, we'd love to hear from you. Put it down in the comments. And uh, hey, I'll put your comment up for everybody to read, which is awesome. Uh, and I will get to some of y'all's comments here in a second, guys. Uh, what I want to do real quick, though, right at the top is uh, ask y'all for some observing reports in the crowd. Um, have you been out observing? Have you been uh, out with your binoculars or your telescope or even just a DSLR or whatever? Um, if you've been out with your just your eyes uh, staring at the at the sky. Let us know. Tell us what you saw. Tell us uh, what you were observing. Um, we'd love to hear telescope reports, um, what you've been working on, if you've been working on any lists or any uh, awards or anything like that. Uh, and I'll turn it over to uh, Eddie since he's at the top here. What you've been observing, Eddie? Anything? Clouds. <laughs> uh, I'm sure everybody remembers we had that hurricane come through and we had some uh, about a week and a half, two weeks of bad weather. And uh, right after that happened, we uh, got the opportunity to drive back to Beaumont to check on the house. And I took that opportunity to bring all my scopes back to Central Texas with me. So hopefully I'm going to get some more observing done here soon. <laughs> well, at least you have the stash with you. So now yeah. your arsenal is, you know, ready to ready to roll whenever you are. So that's always a good thing. Yeah, but uh, Eddie, any any uh, any uh, detail in the clouds? Did you notice any mottling or any kind of uh, uneven surface brightnesses in the clouds? Uh, no, it was just your basic clouds, Will, and it was dark. Uh, I did get the opportunity to do a one-on-one -on -one outreach. We were look outside looking on at some clouds, and uh, my neighbor says, "What's that bright star?" And of course, it was Jupiter, the brightest star. It was just barely peeking through, and. Uh, took a minute to uh, talk about Jupiter and how it was a planet and not a star. And it, it's always very bright and uh, only wish that it would have been a little clearer so that I could have pointed out Saturn right next to it. <laughs> yeah. Cause both of those are right in the same parts of the sky, man. I mean, if you look at Jupiter, look left Saturn, there's no way you can miss it right now. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Great, great. Uh, great thing you're doing there eddie and hopefully the skies are better for you hopefully tonight maybe yeah yeah pluto's up there somewhere too yeah With yeah we were actually we were actually looking at that on the live stream the other night which was pretty pretty epic i think we uh we broadcast pluto for the first time from <laughs> mcdonald awesome. observatory which was fun and we got phobos which is awesome. ridiculous yeah, we were able to capture Phobos. That was in, our, in my last live stream with uh, Stephen Hummel, the man, the myth, the legend, um, yeah. who's always out there killing it. But Howard and Jane, what have y'all been observing lately besides the uh, the beautiful morning with the cup of Joe? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, the, uh, uh, Jane and I really haven't been sticking our, our head out too much, I guess. But anyway, we um, I noticed on um, the satellite thing that uh, the Hubble telescope was coming over about uh, 10 days ago. 
So it was about 9 p.m. when it was coming over Conroe area here. And I hadn't seen the Hubble in really quite a few years. So I made a point to get out to see that. And so about three seconds before it was supposed to come over, I remembered that I was supposed to be out looking for the Hubble. <laughs> and I got out there and threw my tree limbs, because we live in wood forest, which is a forest. And mm -hmm. lo and behold, there it was. And so I did get to see the Hubble pass overhead. And it was about second magnitude. So it's very easy to see. And um, that really is my big observation, other than uh, noticing Jupiter and Saturn so yeah. predominantly in the front yard it, over my daughter's house anyway. Uh, and I know Jane liked it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, who doesn't like to see the Hubble when it comes by, though? That's pretty cool. Oh, and yeah. It's still operational, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And, I, I, you know, you got to wonder how much longer, you know, will we even yeah. be able to see it from here from Earth whenever they deorbit it, you know, and it ends up at the bottom of the Atlantic or Pacific or whatever. But, uh, yeah, well, I think they'll keep it going pretty good till they're pretty sure they're going to have a date for the James Webb to be launched. And so um, I think they'll hold on to the Hubble as long as they can and not let it slip away too quickly. Let's hope so, because, you know, uh, like Dakota said, seeing the Hubble is really cool. I agree. I've, I've seen it maybe 10 or so times, you know, whenever Sky Safari says, hey, Hubble's coming over. I'm like, oh, cool. You know, and you see this little little bitty dot, you know, going across. It's nowhere near as bright as the ISS. I guess at times it can be. Um, but usually when I saw it, it wasn't very bright. But um, like you said, like second or uh, yeah, second, second magnitude. magnitude which is still pretty good for a satellite. And um, and it's the Hubble. I mean, so much. It's completely changed our perspective as humanity uh, that 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 platform has. So uh, to see it is very cool. That's a that's a cool. Up Jane, you've been doing any you've been seeing anything. Who, me? No, Jane. Jane, oh. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> really haven't. Just when we've been over at our daughters, they have kind of a clear area. In their front yard, and so many times, um, you know, we have seen Jupiter up there and Saturn, and uh, so it's much clearer over there. We just have too many trees over here to really yeah. observe. Right. So, but from her swimming pool, even, uh, you know, we can do a little observing. Yes, those I old have, pesky uh, trees. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, it looks like we got some comments coming in. Gary says, uh, I got the moon with Saturn at 5%. Nice, nice. The moon and, and uh, Mars had a really close conjunction the other night, which was very cool. Hope y'all are out actually out getting some Mars time because, man, it's as big as a dinner plate right now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's, a, that's a joke. Don't misquote me, please. Uh, Lori says, Jupiter and Saturn every evening as we walk. Now, there you go. That's the way to do it right there. Just some casual, like, there they are. You're aware of them. It's all good. Um, Dakota says Hubble made a substantial dark matter ob observation recently. Oh, wow. I was unaware of this. Thank you, Dakota. We'll have to look into that maybe for next month's meeting. That's very, very cool. I was unaware of that. Uh, we'll get to some more observations here while we're just while we're doing this thing. Earlier this week, uh, Adam says my dad and I got out with our Ryan Starblast 6-inch reflector telescope uh, we spent some time observing jupiter and saturn later we took a look at vega and arcturus good times there you go that's he's probably the uh, the only uh, real astronomer in the room right now because he's actually getting out with his telescope <laughs> uh, carl carl says i've been observing saturn and took my first photograph that could identify the cassini division nice carl now that that's that's very nice you know the cassini division is a very tiny separation in saturn's rings uh, that you really need a um, decent amount of magnification, you know, so you need to have, you know, pretty zoomed in view. You also need to have really pretty decent skies where the skies are pretty steady uh, because otherwise the, the the boiling of the sky will sort of mask that uh, that disc shape and you won't really see the detail in it. But that, that's awesome, Carl. Very good. 
Um, yeah. Once you Carl's see the Cassini gonna division. A, Carl's going to oh, be a up and coming astronomical photographer. <laughs> there you go. Ast an astrophotographer in the making, folks. Um, the effects of dark matter. There you go, Dakota. Um, well, cool. So we'll get to some more comments as we go along. We got a lot to cover here. And uh, we'll just get into it here. I always try to put, you know, one of these funny memes, you know, especially with the, the way this year has been going. And uh, you can imagine the pain and torture that something like this would uh, would cause you to endure. You know, it's hard enough if you're doing one of these live streams and your you know, nose itches, you got to kind of, you know, do it quick and get out of the way. Right. Uh, but just just imagine not being able to get your hand through your, you know, your pressure suit. Um, I don't know. I, I, I would love to interview some of the former astronauts and see if that was ever, uh, really a problem. I'm sure it is though, but you know, there's probably some, uh, some mental stuff that they can do to try to get rid of that. But, uh, you know, again, scratch your nose before you put the pressure suit on is I think the lesson that that yeah. meme will give you. <laughs> and then I also saw this one and I don't know if many, many of you might not get it, but, uh, this is from Spider-Man. <laughs> Uh, the, the movie Spider-Man. And, uh, you know, I feel this way, too, when I take a picture of the moon with my telescope. You know, I'm more of a scientist myself, um, which is it's a pretty funny meme. I saw that and I had a chuckle. So I figured uh, you you guys and gals might get a laugh out of that, too. Um, yeah, but, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, Willem uh, I think we've all felt that at one time or another. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, oh, look at the clarity in my image. Uh, clearly, I'm yeah. doing that scientific work here uh no willem dafoe is a hilarious actor and so i thought that was that was a funny one i don't know who made it but it was the third one that i have but i think i'm gonna save it for next month our buddy tim over at uh cocktails uh and i think cocktails and astronomy or cocktails and cosmos uh he has a nice little page he's a friend of ours from houston and he made a neat little meme so I'll probably use that next month but um what i wanted to start off with was a little bit of uh some astronomy news, the Vera Rubin Telescope, which has been newly named, uh, it used to be called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or LSST, or LIST, uh, as I was kind of calling it there for a while. Um, they're now calling it the Vera Rubin Telescope after Vera Rubin, you, uh, which is pretty cool. And um, this telescope is basically going to, they say, quote, take a time lapse of the universe. Uh, which I, I find very awesome uh, that they say that because basically it's going to uh, it's, it's got a wide enough field that it will be able to do huge swaths of the sky at night uh, and basically every night that they're, that it's clear, uh, which was, which will, you know, is pretty amazing stuff. But this is sort of the optical design of the telescope. I'm not going to sit here and try to, you know, uh, trick you guys or, you know, stump y'all with any of this stuff. Just basically understand that there's multiple mirrors in this telescope. Um, and it's a very folded design. Um, so, you know, this is a, a little bit of a different design than a lot of these research grade telescopes. And uh, what's interesting to me is the field of view of this thing. Now, this is the full moon. I, I assume that this is superimposed properly on a, a, a section of night sky in the southern hemisphere somewhere. Uh, but there is our moon. Of course, most of y'all can recognize that. And that sort of area with all the squares is where they're going to be able to take a single image, one image. Wow. And then they'll move to the next section and take another image. And then the next section, take another image. And they're going to do the entire sky this way. Um, that's why they call it the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. They're going to find everything. They're going to find asteroids, comets, uh, supernovae, um, you name it. If it's up there, they're probably going to find it. So we'll probably get comets with the name, you know, C2021, blah, 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 Rubin, you know, for the Vera Rubin Telescope. Or uh, yeah, I doubt they'll put the LSST moniker on there, so it'll probably be Rubin. Uh, which will be fantastic, and I think it'll be interesting to see what this telescope does as time goes on. Uh, the mirror on this thing is ginormous, uh, and that's the technical term that actually they use at the at the site there. Uh, you can see a normal human being off to the right there, just kind of hanging out, 
and then you can see the uh, the the massive surface of this mirror. Um, and it's a it's a it's a two it's ground to two different shapes. So you have an inner shape, the M3 surface, and an outer shape, the M1 surface. I don't know what happened to the M2 surface, but I I would assume the M2 surface is the the secondary mirror up top, which is um, spherical. So it's a basically just a you know a roundish sort of mirror. Uh, and then there's some other stuff going on with the optics there that, uh, you know, is way above my pay grade. But here's a general sort of um, way that it kind of goes. You can see you kind of follow these arrows. See, the light comes down from the sky. It hits this outer M3 mirror, right? And it gets launched up this direction into what I think is the M2 mirror, I guess. I'm, I'm just making stuff up here. Uh, I'm not a, a LSST expert by any means. Uh, I am a fan of the project, though. Uh, and you can see the, the light gets then bounced down into the in, inner mirror here and then up into this is the camera, y'all. Um, so we remember how big the, the mirror was. You know, a person is about this tall or so. So this is a, you know, a car-sized uh, camera. And I believe it is the biggest camera on the planet now. Uh, and so here's some of the facts that I found that I found to be absolutely fascinating. The resolution is so good. A golf ball would be visible at 15 miles away, which is amazing. Uh, and again, remember the wide field of this telescope, that's how detailed and how, uh, uh, how much resolution this camera has. So this huge wide field, but insanely small resolution. So that's what you want. They're at 3,200 megapixels, which is, um, I think that's three gigapixels. Uh, did I get that right? I can't remember exactly. I think from mega to giga, I think. Um, yeah. yeah, so, you know, if you have a, a 20 mega, megapixel camera, this thing is nothing compared to the car-sized camera that's on the, uh, the Vera Rubin, which is just absolutely insane. And, y'all, if you made one of the images from this camera, they took the first image the other night, basically, or the other day, of uh, something. It was like a uh, some kind of vegetable, I think, is what they said. Uh, if you made that image full-sized, you're talking 378 4K ultra-high-definition TVs to be able to display it full-size. That's pretty impressive to me. Um, I was unaware of the vast scale of this telescope. Uh, but there it is. It's truly impressive. Um, that's really all I had because, uh, you know, again, that's way above my pay grade and, um, it's absolutely fascinating though. So if you get bored, there's all kinds of videos on YouTube about the Vera Rubin telescope. Um, and you can definitely check that out. Hopefully we discover more about dark matter, kind of like Hubble did the other night. Uh, that's going to be an enormous amount of uh, data coming in, Will. Yeah, I forget the exact number, but I think it's uh, uh, hmm, I think it's petabytes per day. Uh, yeah, so they'll a terabyte. Gather, they'll yeah. gather data faster than they can process it. Exactly. It, they'll, they'll, they'll develop a backlog. Yeah, they'll it, it'll it'll be coming in way too fast for them. Exactly, and there'll be mounds and mounds of this data that they'll be able to crunch over time, and. Um, you know, basically, like I said, it's going to change science in a lot of ways. Uh, and hopefully the Starlink satellites don't uh, don't get in there too much. Of course, I know that's a hot button top, but uh, hey, it's a it's a it's an issue. So we have to kind of um, we have to kind of wonder uh, what the Vera Rubin satellite or the telescope is going to do. And I wanted to point out one more thing before we move on here. These big circular things up here that you see and there's a there's a wheel. There's a bunch of them. That's a filter wheel, if you can imagine such a thing, that sort of turns sideways and then moves the filter down in front of the sensors. Uh, so they can do, you know, I'm assuming hydrogen alpha, H-beta, oxygen three, or, you know, any kind of the normal sort of filters we use as amateurs. seems like that's what they're going to be using in this thing uh, to, to get a, a, a live view of the universe, like in real time, basically. So pretty interesting stuff. That light path is blowing me away. I mean, it's got a, it, it's a ring, like a donut that projects onto another donut 
that projects down to something that we're more accustomed to because it's got a, a smaller central spot. But I, I can't imagine what the central obstruction would calculate out to be in this thing. Yeah. I, the, the opticians who design this thing are, are just pure genius. Um, the fact that this thing is going to work is, is astonishing to me. And I'm just super fascinated by it. Again, I can kind of show the overall look of the telescope itself. It's this one right here. And that's the, you know, that's the overall look of the telescope. It's real stubby as far as, you know, us longer focal length folks are used to. Of course, if you fold the optics down like a, a, a Schmidt Cassegrain, Maxitov Cassegrain, or even a Cass traditional Cassegrain, you can fold the object or uh, fold the optics to where you don't need a 50,000 foot long tube to get the same sort of focal length, right? You can kind of squish these telescopes down. And yeah, like you said, Eddie, that the optical design is just weird, but uh, super fascinating. And, um, and I love it. So figured I'd share that with y'all. Nice. And let's, uh, while we're here, let's get to some comments. Cause uh, Sharon brings in the answer here. Astronauts have a spongy thing in their helmet to scratch their noses. It's called the Valsalva Sal device. Hmm. I'm assuming that's named after a, a, a specific astronaut who probably had a traumatic experience with a nose itch. <laughs> <laughs> and, and probably just couldn't get over it. It's like, I'm putting a sponge in my helmet for this very reason. <laughs> but thank you, Sharon. That's, that's, good. That's, good, uh, that's good information to have. Uh, and Evan says, I just want to know where he got the, uh, infinity gauntlet. Now I think Eddie has all, all the stones too. So yeah, yeah it's, uh, I'm the keeper of the gauntlet for a short time. Uh, <laughs> now that everybody knows it's going to have to be moved again. Yep. Yeah. Now that we all know, we all have to be snapped out of existence. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to keep moving here. Cause we, we're, we got so much stuff to cover. It's ridiculous, but I wanted to highlight this. This is, um, uh, this is an image from a good friend of mine named Mike Sidonio. And I don't know if many of y'all know who Mike Sidonio is. If you don't know who Mike Sidonio is, you need to know who he is. You need to follow him on Facebook at the least. Uh, you should probably just, you know, message him and tell him I sent you and become friends with the guy. He's an absolute genius when it comes to photography. He's one of the best astrophotographers uh, I know, period, full stop, in the world. Um He's from Australia. Uh, he was a former Australian strongman. Uh, he was on boxes of cereal down in Australia, like on the Wheaties box. It was him lifting a big rock. Uh, he was that guy for a while. But the man is a uh, just a protege. Is that is that right? Uh, a prodigy. I, I think that yeah, protege. protege it's a different word. He's a prodigy when it comes to collecting photons from the night sky. And lucky for him, he lives in the southern hemisphere. So this is the uh, this is the small Magellanic cloud, um, and he snapped an image of this. Now this was from a contest that he tried. He entered, didn't win, but he definitely placed uh, in the top, I think, uh, ten or so or nine uh, out of five thousand or so images that were submitted. Um, if you know Mike Sidonio, you know how deep he goes. Um, he is not satisfied with a ten-hour exposure of this or that galaxy. The guy goes for days and days and days and sometimes weeks with his images and compiles all that data together. And then you get these insane images like, like I have here. You can see that, you know, obviously the, the galaxy is a, a sort of a, a, a less organized galaxy. It's the small Magellanic cloud. For those of y'all in the Southern hemisphere, you may be familiar with this thing. You probably see it naked eye all the time, but thing I thought that was super interesting is the H2 regions. So you've got all these red pockets of gas and dust. You can see them all just all throughout here. Like it has some kind of infection or something, the chicken pox, this galaxy. Uh, but that's a good thing for a galaxy because those H2 regions or hydrogen two regions mean star formation. So those of us in the Northern hemisphere, you know, something like this little guy here, maybe uh, some of these little knots over here. Think um, Orion Nebula or uh, the, uh, the uh, what, no, what am I thinking? The Lagoon, sorry. Um, think those kind of nebulas, those big, massive complexes of star formation. Those are the, um, 
those are the areas I think that are super fascinating in this. And then up here, you've got one of the most famous objects in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, 47 Tucani, Tucani, I think is how you say it. I'm not exactly sure. It's a massive globular cluster. It's just a little bit smaller than um, Omega Centauri, but I think it has a brighter core. Um, hmm. And I think this galaxy that we're looking at here is, what, 250,000 light years away or so? I feel like it's something like that. Don't quote me on the exact number, but um, I got to send congratulations out to my buddy Mike Sidonio. Even though he didn't win, that's an amazing image. Um, and you spell Sidonio, S-I-D-I-O-N-I. Sidonio. Oh, there's an O at the end. Sidonio. So it sounds, it's spelled just like it sounds. So follow Mike. I guarantee you won't be disappointed. That is a great image. I, I, I love globular clusters, especially when they're uh, caught with other objects in the sky. And this, this Magellanic cloud is enormous. I mean, I, I know it's a smaller of the two, but it, the size of it, it's huge. It is huge. And then like one of your favorite things down here, Eddie, there's another globular Mm -hmm. um right there which is uh, in contrast to this big old guy up here you know uh it's just it's it's hilarious the diversity of the globulars i i like globulars too. i know howard's a big fan of globulars as well i am <laughs> <laughs> he's good. seen many many a globular probably more than or <laughs> even up there somehow he's seen more than <laughs> more than is up there well there's 150 so, what 157 and uh in the um, AL workbook, so you got your work cut out for you if you start looking for them. Yeah, you know it's uh, and they're and they're sometimes, you know, you're like, am I looking at it? Is it is this stellar thing that's sort of fuzzy a globular or you know? Sometimes you look at them and you're like, oh, okay, that's a globular. There's no doubt about it. And some Howard uh, even almost look like open clusters, don't they? They're they're all they're so tight, but they're not. They're not quite loose enough to be a, an open cluster. They're, they still hold that globular designation. Yeah. I, in fact, in a few minutes, whenever I do my little talk, um, I'm going to show you that of two different globulars that, and how they, uh, how they look side by side, kind of. Very change. cool. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, Adam says, I'd be curious to know how that data is stored. Actually, it might be stored at a friend of mine in Australia, uh, another friend of mine, uh, Stefan, who owns a company that does exactly that. They get data from all the radio telescopes on the planet, essentially, uh, and they store their data. They are a big data farm, and they held the data for the Lord of the Rings movies and just so many other things, just so much data. These guys are geniuses down there in Australia doing some really cool astronomy, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, George says Starlink is equal to Galaga. Yeah. I wish we could, you know, kind of maybe shoot them out of the air. Wasn't that the game, I think, where you shot? <laughs> so we'll just keep on rolling here. We won't we won't talk too much about Starlink. I know y'all how y'all feel about that. Uh, <laughs> officers comments. Well, I've had a bunch of comments. Let's see if Mr. Eddie has any because uh, he is our. Money man, what do you got, Eddie? Anything? Yeah, well, well, I'm the treasurer of the uh, astronomy club, and uh, there's been no changes, no money coming in, no money going out of our bank account since the last meeting. And uh, probably the biggest news is this is the end of the third quarter coming up, and this is the time that I compile our roster and send it off to the astronomical league so that they have the latest, greatest list of our members. And then uh, any members who've joined recently will now start getting the Reflector magazine from the uh, Astronomical League. So I'll send out that before the end of September, and I'll, I'll also send out uh, an updated roster to our uh, to our members. And Very, that's cool. About it. Very cool. Thank you for doing what you do, Eddie. We appreciate you keeping track of our massive bank account and uh, making sure. Everybody gets what they need, man. We really appreciate that. You're doing an excellent job. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Howard Miner, as our newsletter editor, uh, you got anything uh, club-wise you need to add before your presentation here in a few seconds? 
Well, I just uh, wanted you to notice in the September issue that Brenda uh, wrote about three articles to put in the newsletter and her job structure where she did the minutes and that type of thing. We've kind of, since there's been no minutes of the club meetings uh, through the pandemic, um, I've just required, not required, I requested her to uh, maybe just do a news article in where she did the minutes. So now each month there will be a news article that um, Brenda has uh, given us to uh, to enjoy. So look for oh. that. And um, otherwise, I uh, didn't get any really comments uh, or observations for September uh, when I put out the newsletter. And, um, of course, you didn't get any comments from Eddie or I either very much on observing. So uh, hmm. we can't be too critical about others. So anyway, <laughs> uh, that's kind of the story on the newsletter. And um, Jane has been doing her thing. And um, so that's and it. We and we appreciate Jane uh, catching all your mistakes. Of course, we know there's only a few, but uh, Jane, Jane's like, no, Howard, that's the wrong, that's the wrong word there. You can't use that word. So <laughs> I know she keeps you in line for sure. Well, thank you, Howard. Okay. Um, and we'll let's go to the next slide, which is the treasure report. We just got that one. One thing I will say about the treasure report is if you do shop on Amazon, um, if you would make us your Amazon smile people, we would love that. The money comes out of Jeff Bezos' pocket, not yours or ours. Uh, if you go to smile.amazon.com and you look up the Astronomical Society of Southeast Texas, uh, you'll find us. Or if you want to search that EIN number right there, you can put that number in and uh, it'll take you directly to us. You can make us your charity of choice and uh, we will take your free money. We, we, will, we would love it. Uh, it'll, it'll help us do what we do here as a club. And, um, you know, you're shopping on Amazon probably anyway. Uh, so if you want to and if you don't want to support us, you can always support. There's great causes out there. Feeding America, the American Cancer Society. There's so, so many good ones. Um, so, hey, you know, uh, support us or support them. Uh, if you're going to do that shopping thing, uh, we would appreciate it. They would appreciate it. It's, uh, it's a good thing. And it's a great way for you to kind of give back. Um, on Amazon if you do your shopping there and uh, the top the top part is what it'll look like uh, or I'm sorry the middle part is what it'll look like when you're representing us or when you're when you're shopping for us uh, and giving us your 0.5 percent uh, and you can see it there Astronomical Society of Southeast Texas uh, that number up top and to the right is old that was a that was as of May we probably are kind of gonna get our next uh, payment in pretty soon but what I want to bring to your attention right here is when you're at the Amazon Smile tab, it says supporting, and it'll say your charity of choice right there. So as long as it says Astronomical Society of Southeast Texas and you're supporting us, we'll get that cashola, and we would really appreciate it. So if you shop on Amazon, we'd love it. And um, I'll go through these Jane next slides pretty – oh, sorry. Go ahead, Howard. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say that Gina has been taking advantage of that um, through the pandemic, through the pandemic and uh, pandemic. And so, anyway, it, uh, we order quite a bit of stuff through Amazon. And so, whenever you get your next count, Eddie, it ought to go up. <laughs> well, I, I want to point out that uh, last meeting, by we had already gotten our second quarter donation. From Jeff Bezos and Amazon, uh, so it came in last month, and it, you're right, it was an uptick in what we usually get. And uh, I guess I hadn't thought about it, but I guess I would attribute that to uh, all the online shopping that had been going on during the pandemic. Good point. Yeah, there's been. I mean, everybody's yeah. been online shopping these days. I mean, it's pretty much the smartest way to do it. And um, so, yeah. Um, if you want to make us your charity of choice, we would really appreciate it. We're going to take that money by new equipment for outreach, uh, which is when everything is normal. Our club is very passionate about. We do multiple events a year where we bring our scopes out to libraries and kid events and kid museums and 
just wherever anybody will let us go and we'll show the moon, we'll show the sun, whatever it is. And, um, it's, it's a fantastic thing. And, you know, hopefully we've reached a few lives over the years and, uh, inspired some people to go into, uh, science or, you know, one of the STEM, uh, fields and, um, hopefully uh, make a difference in the world. That's our goal. That's, that's why we do what we do. And I think that's why most clubs do outreach, right? I would guess. I'd hope. Um, instead of just, you know, trying to promote how awesome telescopes are. Um, <laughs> we do have uh, dark sky dates. I'm not going to go through those because all of those have been canceled. All of our outreach events for the year have been canceled. Um, we're, our club is pretty awesome. We have a loner scope program. If you're a member of our club and local, uh, and you've been with us for a little while. We know who you are, where to find you and all that. You can loan a scope out, bring it home for free, and uh, tear up the nighttime and see what you can find up there because there's always cool stuff to see. And uh, most clubs like us have a program just like this. So if you're not from the Beaumont, Texas area, maybe you're from Michigan or Vermont or Florida, who knows where, you probably have a, a club near you that's a, a local astronomy club that has a program like this. So get with them and see if you can get in the mix. And people always ask me, what telescope do you recommend people buy? I never do. I say join an astronomy club, go go loan out their, their telescopes, get a feel for how the different styles work, and then see what's right for you. And then if you come up against a roadblock, it's not just you trying to look up YouTube videos <laughs> all the time. It's, you know, you can actually call somebody in the club and be like, hey, how do you turn it on again? Where's the power switch? You know, whatever it is. So um, get in those local astronomy clubs, y'all. I promise you it'll change your life. But if you do join us, you do have uh, some incentives. We have a club newsletter, again, presented by Mr. Howard Miner here. Does a fantastic job uh, every month. And uh, you get all these other awesome benefits as well, which are always fantastic. Um, so we'll just keep on rolling here and y'all can read, right? Y'all can read all those awesome benefits of being a part of our club. I won't go through too much of that. Uh, but we do have some ISS passes coming up for the Beaumont, Texas area. Now I do these based on Beaumont, Texas, because that's where our club is, uh, is at. Um, now if you're in Michigan or wherever, one of those other States that I mentioned earlier, your dates will, and times will vary, uh, because these are for, particular location um you can see uh that this morning there was one uh, uh september 11th at 6 25 a.m is when it started um and then i always like to look at this particular group of squares right here the highest point and you can see the the bigger the number is the closer it is to 90 the closer it is to directly overhead so what i do is i just kind of go through there's 79 that's a pretty good one uh september 14th at negative 3.9, that's almost negative fourth magnitude, um, which is bright. You're going to have to wake up a little earlier for this one, though. Whoops. I hit a button. Uh, you can see 5.43 a.m., um, which some of y'all might be going to bed or some of y'all might be just waking up. But, you know, a lot of y'all are probably waiting until about 7 a.m. to wake up or so, which I fully understand and respect. Um, <laughs> and then you can see it switches. Uh, it goes from the, the zero sort of numbers, which is morning, and then it goes into the sort of the evening stuff. And then this is your best chance for an evening pass in Beaumont on September 17th. Negative 3.3 magnitude. That is a bright pass, y'all. That is going to be a good one. And what is that, 10 p.m.? Or is that, I always get these wrong. Is that 8? That's 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, okay. Yeah. I always get military time Start wrong. So. No, that's 9 o'clock, Will. 18 o'clock. is 6 o'clock. Okay. See, I told you I'd get it wrong. I promised, I promised that. That's the only thing I can deliver on. Um, but 65 degrees is pretty good. Uh, pretty, pretty good. And, um, so you'll be able to see the uh, the ISS there. And then one little pass in October, and this is as far out as their prediction goes because, you know, again, the ISS is falling back to Earth very slowly. So they, the, it's, it's, its path around the Earth gets harder to predict the further you go. So keep that in mind uh, and uh, keep that, you know, you're going to basically want to keep the uh, – if, if you're looking for accuracy, you want to keep those dates pretty close to when you're going to go out. Uh, but October 7th is the uh, is the next evening one, essentially. I mean, you've got a couple of, you know, not so bright ones. 
I mean, this is pretty bright, negative 2.1, but at 33 degrees, eh, it's kind of low on the horizon. Still pretty good, though, if you got a, if you got a decent right. But uh, there you go. There's the ISS passes, and that's the International Space Station, for those of you all that might be wondering. It's that thing right there. Um, and we can see it from Earth. Either of you guys have been able to observe it lately? There's people on it. There uh, is. Two less than there were, what, a month ago? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Doug, Bob and Doug just came home, right? Yeah, we had a splashdown, one of the first splashdowns we've had in many years. That's yeah, pretty awesome. Yeah. And uh, hopefully they'll close the range next time, get, get the people out of there. We'll see what happens yeah. there. That'll be fun. That'll be That'll be interesting to see. Okay, so let me go. Uh, what I want to do now is we're going to switch gears here and talk about a constellation. Now, a lot of us know that the stars in the sky, they make shapes here and there, right? And we all, and, you know, we didn't get to decide on any of these shape names, you know, uh, but people that came long before us did. And uh, so what Howard's going to do now is he's going to take us through a tour of one of my favorite uh, constellations. So, Howard, take it away, sir. Okay. Well, um, my report is going to be on um, Capricorn. And Capricorn is represented by the sea goat. <laughs> and it's a half goat and half fish. And um, so anyway, that's kind of wild. But yeah, anyway, I didn't even notice that, Howard. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, so strange. Up there for a minute. And um, uh, we all know what mythical figures are, you know. It's, uh, it's kind of like Will. You know, when Will dies, he'll be in the stars. And so we'll <laughs> all be able to see Will. Oh, that's a joke. Yeah. <laughs> Cassiopeia, Cassiopeia is a W, though, so I don't know. <laughs> <Let's>, uh, <laughs> but anyway, Capricorn, you can change the slide, I guess. And okay. to the, that um, yeah, to that one. And as you see, it's uh, surrounded by other constellations, Aquila and Sagittarius, Microscopium, Pisces, Astrinus. And Aquarius and Sagittarius and Aquarius both have deep sky objects that are just really almost on the border of Capricorn. So I'm we're going to discuss those just a little bit also. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Capricorn is in the southern horizon, uh, in the southern sky hemisphere, but it's high enough to where here in the Houston area. That uh, in Beaumont area, that it's you can see it rather easily from a dark sky site. Uh, Capricorn is a faint um, constellation, but at the same time, um, <laughs> it's the stars in it vary from about uh, third magnitude down to fifth magnitude. But in, from a dark sky side, you can see the whole constellation and enjoy it. And anyway, it's got kind of an arrowhead shape pointing down is one thing. Or some people kind of look at the whole constellation and see a boat out of the thing or uh, the keel of a sailboat or something like that. So it does have... Uh, a shape that's kind of interesting. One of the, um, uh, let's go ahead, uh, everybody look at that and get the kind of feel of the constellation. But well, you can change to the next one, number three. Uh, there you go. And on number three, we've done the eastern side of the constellation and I just wanted you to notice up there, uh, actually the brightest star in um, Capricorn is the Delta star and number 49 up there. And it um, also is a variable star and it's just barely over. It's uh, 
2.9, no, what is that? 3.1, 2.9, that's what it is. 2.9 magnitude, which is just barely, uh, basically third magnitude. Mm -hmm. But anyway, as you look at that star, you notice it has a circle around it. Well, that circle uh, actually uh, represents a variable star, and that circle represents how bright uh, the star uh, gains and brightness and the center dot is how dim the star gets and being variable so anyway I just wanted you to kind of make note of that and of course the main thing on this slide is we kind of down look straight down from 49 and you see over here epsilon is the next star down in the constellation and then zeta and uh, and I just wanted to say too that since it's Delta is the brightest star that um, uh, the stars this is a great as the second brightest star and that type of thing so anyway but we're going to move on down um, to the next slide I guess and um, um, look at M30. No, we use this slide, don't we? No, we're going to use M30. The fourth slide, that's it. There you go. And I want to want you to notice the detail here. Number one, it has a uh, bright central core. And of course, this is a nice Hubble photograph. The three uh, globulars that I'm showing are... Uh, or Hubble photographs. So they kind of compare somewhat with each other. But you can, the ways you can look at different detail is one in strings of stars is one way to determine uh, what this globular has. And if you look carefully there, you can see uh, various dim strings of stars. You can see bright strings, some of the bright three stars in the center uh, make up a little short string and three stars kind of on the right hand side bright uh, so it's kind of interesting from that standpoint there those are things you can look for in uppers and of course uh, through our telescope our when I say our I mean our small amateur telescopes that we're going to see a central ball kind of blob and then out toward the edges we're going to see points of light come in our eyeball as we pick up the photons from those stars and so you're going to get on most globulars you're going to get a bright center and then have uh, points of light coming out from it around the edges and then um, so, uh, let's see here. Look at my notes. Oh, I wanted to say, uh, this globular is 93 light years across from side to side. And, uh, and I would assume that would make it, you know, kind of shape. We're looking at it flat. So, that has 167,000 thousand stars in it. And... Um, also, it's very far from us, uh, 27,000 light years in distance. And so it, one of its points is that um, apparently the cluster had some changing process that caused the core to collapse. And um, so this is one of the, with all of that pulling in, is one of the highest density regions of the Milky Way galaxy. So anyway, uh, I think we can move on to the next slide, Will, when you get a chance. And that um, okay. Sorry, guys. Is the uh, west side of uh, sorry, guys. I, of, I had a little bit of internet malfunction there. Apparently, it just logged me off. Oh. Let me, uh, okay. I'm sorry. I don't even know what happened. It just, everything froze and I'm like, where'd Howard go? <laughs> there we go. Oh, 
Uh, you did y'all didn't hear what I was saying? Oh my god. I think Yeah, <laughs> I no. No, they heard, heard you. Before. They they just didn't hear me or see me or anything. So we're we're good. We're good now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now oh, we no. move to the western uh, side of uh Capricorn. And um you see here uh, M, we see a little group of stars appear toward the top of the illustration. And then off to the left of it, this is the constellation of Aquarius to the left. And right there is the M72 is almost right on boundary. And then there's M73. And then there's NGC7009. And so we're going to start with M72. And... Um, uh, you can go ahead and put that up on the screen. There we go. Now, what do we have here? It's what Will was talking about earlier. This globular cluster, M72, there is no big overexposed blob core right in the center of the galaxy. And so it's more open, we, you would say, it's still a globular cluster, but it um, is uh, the difference there. And so, again, the things I look for immediately are the bright stars versus the dim stars, or is the cluster, um, you know, how would you rate that as far as brightness goes over the overall brightness? And it does have some strings of stars through it. And especially up in the upper right-hand corner, there's a faint string. And there's some strings of semi-bright stars down the left side over there. And another thing I just wanted to mention was that when you're looking at objects like this, that you always want to note if there's things that's not there, you know, or there uh, in your field of view like a, a little small galaxy. I don't know what this thing is up here in the upper right hand, upper left hand corner, but there's a little smudge up there. And yeah, those kind of galaxy. Uh huh. It's a galaxy. It's a, a face on galaxy too. Yeah. Okay. And so anyway, that uh, those need to be noted in your log. And when you're jotting stuff down, is what other objects appear in your field of view. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah. And again, um, this was uh, discovered by the French astronomer uh, Pierre McChain, Messine, uh with um, Messier in 1780. So the, cu the cluster is faint. Uh, surrounding star fields become visible. The overall magnitude is 9.4, and it's about 50,000 light years away from us. All the most globular clusters are old, ancient parts, maybe old parts of galaxies. Or could have been a galaxy or something like that at one time of uh, billions of years ago, literally billions of years ago. So anyway, that's about what I have on that. And we can uh, move on to M73. If you're there, there we go. And <laughs> this doesn't really look like a Missy A object at all. Now I imagine Missy A when his scope that they were looking for that was maybe somewhat of a smudge, but this is an open cluster. And this open cluster has four stars in it. You can count them. One, two, three, four. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, here's a little open cluster. And so they really figure M73 being an open cluster, the reason it's listed on uh, Missy A's list is the fact it's only a little over one degree away from the globular cluster we were just looking at. So 
went ahead and logged it as a cluster, maybe, at that time. But, of course, now it's an open cluster. And it's really not even a cluster. The four stars, a couple of one of them is way far away. One of them is rather close to us, and the other two are in between. They're not even a cluster, those four stars. Anyway, it ended up on Missy A's list. I thought that was kind of interesting. And yeah. so we can really uh, move on to the next thing, and that's um, going to be the Saturn Nebula. <laughs> and the Saturn, uh, I don't know. I have not looked at the Saturn Nebula many times. I've looked quite a few at it. But I've always, what the sculpts are using, I really had a hard time seeing the little knobs on each side of the, of the central part of the planetary nebula. And this is a planetary nebula, the Saturn Nebula is, and it's NGC 7009. And it's right there all together with the other two objects. But anyway, the Saturn is interesting to try and study because you have a rather bright ball and when you first see it you may confuse it for a bright star but it doesn't take long for your eyes to adjust that you got a planetary nebula there but the little knobs on each end each side on the horizontal you know represents the plane of the rings around Saturn, and as you would see at edge on. So that's kind of an interesting object, and, and it's one you should get out and see, because it's certainly visible in the small scopes that uh, most of our members have. And of course, the bigger you go, the more you can see. It does have a central star, by the way, of 11 and a half magnitude. But it takes 18-inch telescope on up. We all ought to be able to see it in this 22. Oh yeah. And so, uh huh. Yeah, Have I've seen definitely it? seen. Oh, I've seen the Saturn Nebula many, many times. Absolutely, it's one of my favorites. You seen the? Have you seen the center star? Uh, I'm not sure that I recall seeing the central on this one, okay. but. Next time I look, I'll uh, I'll definitely make a note of it. Yeah, it's 11 and a half magnitude, but it said it was difficult to bring out. That's mm. for sure. Okay. And uh, so anyway, uh, let's just move on to M75, Well. Okay. And now we got another gob here. And this looks different than the first two that we looked at. This is our third one and last one. And it certainly has a blobby uh, core, bright overexposed core, where it indicates the stars are really packed tightly together. And not really too many chains of stars, up ex except up at the top right. There's a nice little string of stars that start out with a kind of a red star and string down to another red star. So that's kind of interesting. And so, but the, it really looks different than the first two. If you remember back to M30, the first one we looked at, it had bright stars in it that went through the middle kind of. And so very, very much different. So each globular that you observe are, you are definitely going to find changes. So, and on the lists and stuff, all these globulars, there's um, classification that go along with it. And when you do the globular cluster list, it tells you how to classify a globular cluster. And there's like three steps to come up with a cl the cluster um, classification. 
So anyway, it's not hard to do. It, um, so anyway, you can go ahead and do that. This pretty much brings us to the end, but yeah, that I want to look at right there that Will's brought up. And that's a little group of stars up at the top uh, right side of um, Capricorn. And these I'm right here, Howard. Animal, the, these I'm right here? Sorry. I'm getting back feet or something. Um, the two top stars, Alpha 1 and Alpha 2, are naked eye doubles. And so I can remember a kid back in the 50s that I could look up there and see those two little stars very close together, naked eye. Of course, I had no idea what constellations even were maybe at that time yet. And um, But I did see that in the summertime, that that, that was be there. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And all those stars right down there, there's Alpha, there's a B thing, and that's New, and Beta, and going down is Rho, and Pi, and Omicron. And the numbers out to the side, by the way, those are the Flamsteed numbers, Flamstead or Flamsteed. And he assigned the numbers usually by brightness in the constellations. And, of course, the Greek letters, the bare uh, Greek letters are there. So, anyway, the, all those stars down to Omicron, they're all great doubles for small telescopes. Some of them are very wide that you can separate almost with your naked eye. And others um, are tight but they're all observable. So there's a nice little grouping of doubles, and that's my report. Now you all awesome, can wake man. up. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I was, I was hoping my internet wouldn't lag out in the middle of that again, because uh, that was pretty, pretty annoying. But thank you, Howard. That's awesome. You know, like I said, uh, Capricorn is one of my favorite constellations because, you know, it's just, it's, like you said, it's a funny looking kind of thing. If pull it up there, like the whole thing is sort of a, I've always called it the cosmic bikini bottom, which is kind of a weird, you know, thing. But if you <laughs> kind of look at it, it's kind of got the cosmic bikini bottom kind of thing going for it. But uh, I like, I like what George Lutch said earlier, since it is a fish and like a, a, a land animal surf and turf. I think we should call it the surf and turf constellation from here on out. Cause that is pretty oh, funny. There you go. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Uh, if you guys have any questions for Howard about that, please uh, send them in now. It'll be a delay before we get to them, but we will get to that. But Enrique says uh, Capricorn is a Makara, a protector and transport for the gods in India, which is pretty interesting stuff. Of course, we know that all different cultures from all over the world had different, you know, different things that they, they saw in the star shapes, of course. Uh, and so there you go. Yeah. I'll say it yeah, again, Howard. India, Sorry. Yeah, India, of course, uh, had their version, and the and the Arabs had their version, and the Greeks had their version, and um, so anyway, that um, that's interesting information. Thank you. Absolutely, I, uh, Adam. Yeah, yeah. And Adam, terrific job, Howard. So good job, um, Howard. Thank you. You're welcome. Yep. I find it interesting, Howard, that the Delta star is the brightest star. Usually it's the Alpha star that's the brightest star. This is a, right. an exception. Yes, uh, that's, uh, that's an exception. And then so it, uh, I think the whole constellation is an exception almost. So, But <laughs> anyway, every star party that Will and I have been to, or I've been, I went to a lot before Will started and then, uh, I figured out that I've been to around 50 star parties. And out of that, those are seven days a week on the average that I go to or been to. And so that's somewhere between um, 250 to 300 nights of observing. 
Wow. That's a lot of nights, and probably half of those were all nighters where you stayed up all night. So I thought that was, and I can uh, I can just see Capricorn at the uh, uh, Okie Tech Star Party up there in the sky. I mean, I can just visualize that. It's embedded in my mind. <laughs> and That's awesome. So, Go to star parties. Have fun. Exactly. (laughs) And I agree with that. And Howard's right. Once you know that thing over there is Orion or Capricornus or whatever it is, it seems to solidify in your brain. Um, There are a lot of constellations, but some of them are very easy. This one's a little bit uh, more challenging sometimes to find. But once you know where it is, like, like Howard said, you'll always be able to find it. And uh, it's a fun one. Again, the Saturn Nebula is something we all should be looking at. Uh, 73, M72. Um, and I'm going to check out that uh, that Alpha Star for that double. I want to check that out, see if I can see that naked eye, and then also put a scope on oh, it, yeah. see what that looks like. Yeah, you won't have any problem with that. And, of course, each one of those, Alpha 1 is a double. Alpha 2 is a double. So it's Sarda, like the double double in in um, in Lara, but yeah. it's it's not that either. But at the same time, both of those stars are their own double, and and can be seen in smaller scopes. And they're got colors to them. A lot of them have got the orange hues and and blues and this kind of stuff so uh, for the most part they're all the doubles are colorful stars interesting stuff there uh and there was a question for you howard since we're here we might as well take it uh where do you get your paper maps for taking notes adam wants to know (laughs) this particular map that we're looking at came out of Ah, Let's see. Nice, nice Sky Observer's sky Guide. And what I did, I just went to the page, which that's on, and with my little camera, I took a picture of the page. So what you're looking at is a photo that I just made and uh, then did some touch-up. Then I printed it out. That's And... Did some handwriting on it, but um, anyway, it. Um, I think it's a. I got the wrong book here. It's this is the autumn and winter, and I'm needing. This. Oh yeah, but it, it's the right. But anyway, yeah. it, that's the trick with those books. From. A lot of my charts come from the night sky observer's guide. Comes from just the. Uh, Sky Telescope uh, Atlas 2000, and mm. I take I do a lot of this taking pictures of things and and get them that way. There's other ways of doing it, but I'm not yeah, very technical, and so I get it done <laughs> the best I can. <laughs> hey, you got it. When I first started observing, you showed me a lot of your work, and I I was always impressed with your note taking. I mean, you write in your books and on your paper charts. And that is, that was so against my grain growing up is like, do not write in your books. <laughs> and here's Howard, you know, he's got all his personalized notes all scribbled all in the pages. <laughs> and, and I love that about that, about your work, Howard. It's very personal like that. Yeah, and you guys well, should definitely see his moon sketches. And uh, I believe, you could be mistaken about this, Howard, but I believe the Herschel 400 list, which is 400 objects, he uh, sketched all those. Uh, I could be mistaken. Yeah. But that's I think that sounds right, Howard, right? Um, I'll take it up and show you, but I have three. I have four three-ring binders of material for the, and they're two-inch binder, four two-inch binders to do the Herschel 400. That's amazing. (laughs) 
and I feel like a jerk because all I did was cool galaxy, kind of fuzzy. Next object, peace, you know. Here, here's one of my manuals, and I've look at that. And, uh, and he did it, it in less time than me. Huh? It, it took me over four years. It took you a little bit under. It's crazy, Howard. You're fast. <laughs> That's excellent. I've been I've been trying to beg Howard for years to to publish that, you know, in some way. Um, and I might actually, since I know where Howard lives, I might actually just have to sneak over there and uh, steal it, and then you know put it back later when he's not looking. And uh, then we'll we'll put it out, and he won't. He'll be like, "Where's all this money coming from? Why not <laughs> Amazon book sales? What is this?" <laughs> Let's get that up there. There you go. Oh, yeah, it's coming in. I don't know if it'll focus. Yeah, there it is. Hold it right there. That's your sketch of an elliptical galaxy in Pisces. Yeah. 10.6 magnitude. Good. Yeah. Look at that. I put my log sheets. I have two objects on one page. And on the back, <laughs> and I print my log sheets on a little heavier weight paper, and it's not the 20 pound, the next up. And so I can write on both sides without bleeding through. But anyway, um, a lot of times all those little galaxies are just little smudges. It's very easy to draw one, you know, stick <laughs> your finger in the dirt and then smear it on the... <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah, you that's all it. you have to do. <laughs> yeah, Howard, here's my notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do that again. You're the man, Howard. You are the man. <laughs> yeah, you know, like I said, uh my notes are not anywhere near as detailed, but as you go through this, you know, you learn from people like Howard and people that are doing it better than you. And so then you become better because of that, uh, which is a good thing. That's the beauty of star parties, man. Like Howard said, go to star parties, like period, just do it. Uh, yeah. Because there are people out there that are better than you or I at this. And we're going to go hang out with them and talk with them and learn from them uh, in the field, doing what we do. So you just get accustomed. It becomes your culture of, of what we're doing out there. It becomes your own little thing. We're at dusk. You have dinner, you walk out to your setup, you start taking stuff off, taking eyepieces out, getting everything ready. At midnight, you go back for coffee or whatever, you know, and it becomes this ritual uh, that you sort of do. And I can tell you that some of my most happy moments of my life have been walking from my camping situation, whether it be tent, uh, camper, whatever, to my setup with the skies as wide open as you can imagine. You know, we're going to have a clear night all night, and I'm just walking down there like, you know uh but that's something that i think you can only really understand if you go do it um and you know you can tell howard has been doing it pretty hardcore for many many years um and that's why he is such a well-seasoned observer so thank you howard for that uh and then lonnie mosley coming in with a very famous lonnie mosley saying that he always says at star parties which i always loved uh howard has forgotten more than any of us know and that's probably <laughs> true yeah um <laughs> At, at least in my yeah, experience, it's going fast. <laughs> he's like, it's going faster, but Hey, that's how it goes. You know? And if you don't keep up with this knowledge, sometimes you might lose it a little bit, but Howard stays up to date. And uh, that's what we love about that. Howard, thank you for that, man. That's fantastic stuff. Good job, Howard. You're welcome. I would clap, but it'd be way too loud in here. Uh, <laughs> let me get over to my thing. Well, one, one thing I really want to talk about real quick before we get uh, to Eddie's um, solar report. Well, I'm not I'm not showing my screen. There we go. Uh, September 11th is the first day of the Oki Tech Star Party, which would have been today. Um, so instead of having this meeting tonight, we would have probably most of us would have been out in that little bitty. Uh, you can see that little bitty point out in the middle of nowhere in the panhandle of Oklahoma out there. And uh, we go out there for typically, like Howard said, more than seven days, typically. And um, what that allows us to do is get the best opportunity for clear skies and um, to 
I mean, because, you know, you're going to lose a night here or there to weather or whatever. You might be tired one night. You might have observed the last three or four nights straight till dawn. And that night you might be like, I'm going to wake up at midnight and start or something. You know, it just depends on how the, the weather goes for these things. But um, Okie Tex is one of my favorite star parties uh, of all time. And what I want to do is while we're talking about it and kind of kind of kind of run with this, let's see if I can pull this up while. Um, I guess I can't hear. <laughs> I guess I can't talk and chew gum at the same time. Um, cause that's what I'm trying to do here, even though there's no gum. Uh, there we go. And, oh, uh, so what I want to do is just kind of run, uh, this little video here, which is just, uh, you know, a clip of the, uh, the video that I took, uh, at last year's key text, which would have been 2019. Uh, again, Okie Tex is a star party held in that little town right there. That's Kenton, Oklahoma. Believe it or not, there's actually a town called Kenton, Oklahoma, and there's maybe 50 people that live there. And then just across the hill, it's or artist. the Mesa. Yeah. It's Go ahead, an artist community. It's oh, interesting. I didn't, hmm, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, yeah. It's right next to this place called Camp Billy Joe, and uh, you can see here that when Oki, Texas is running, amateur astronomers from all over the country descend on this place because it, it truly is one of the darkest places that uh, most of us have access to, I think. Um, maybe if you went in the middle of the ocean, you'd, you'd get a little bit darker skies, but, you know, who has a boat that big, I guess, right? But um, so what we do is we all kind of pile out into this massive field, and you can see here I'm kind of flying a drone over the uh, this field situation into the field um and uh again this was from last year you can see all the different setups and that's what i love about going to these star parties and kind of getting this kind of footage for for people because you know a lot of people may maybe not be able to make it to a star party you know maybe they don't have a reliable vehicle that can drive 800 to 1500 miles uh one way to go out to a place like this um so they kind of have to hear about the event later um, but it's definitely an event I think uh, everyone should do at least once in their life. Um, I've been to, I think, five or six Oki Tex uh, in the past. Um, I think 2014 was my first year. Um, you can see that some people tent camp it. You know, you got a nice little tent there and you can sleep it off. And, um, you know, if it's raining, you can hang out in the tent. Some people bring their RVs. Uh, this is the New Mexico group. Uh, it's a big old group from New Mexico. I think it's Albuquerque, maybe Albuquerque. Um, they come over and uh, they just take up a huge section of the area. Uh, you can see my camper there with the Texas flag. You can see some of my friends out there doing their thing. People come out there to image. They come out there to do like what Howard does, which is visual astronomy and what I do um, and what Eddie does. Um as Jason Fry with his setup and a friend of ours from the Texas star party and um, Bob's telescope there, I think, and a good friend of mine. And basically it's, it's row after row of uh, astronomy nerds, if you will, um, if, if you want to go down that road. Uh, but that's really what it is. And uh, we just kind of take over this little camp, uh, which is just out in the middle of nowhere again. And it's a perfect place to do, astronomy i can tell you that i've seen some of the most amazing views uh of my life here at Okie tech star party uh and there's stuff to do during the daytime you can go hiking uh there's dinosaur footprints nearby there's a volcano an extinct volcano nearby you can go tour uh just a lot of really cool stuff um and a lot of fun there's talks there's giveaways there's all kinds of things um now obviously we're not doing uh Okie techs this year uh, because of COVID, they did cancel it, um, and uh, there's like the the tent is no more, guys. Like now a permanent building being built uh, at Oki Tex, right there at the basketball court, which is just to the left there. And uh, so they have a big metal building coming for us for 2021. Uh, that's the Oklahoma City crew right there. They all take over a huge section of the uh, of the area there, all getting a line. And that's Bill Christian's telescope, a member of our club. He has a 25 inch massive telescope that he's put up on the basketball court he's gonna have to come down with us now though i think observe with us because uh you can't get to the basketball court anymore unfortunately and um but you know again these videos that i make are on my youtube channel 
Uh, you can go view them anytime. If you're curious about a star party, if you want to know like what goes on out, you know, what people bring, because, you know, you might be wondering, I might want to go to a star party, but I might not know what to bring with me. Do I need to bring a tent? Should I bring an air mattress versus a cot? Should I bring this or that? You know, and sometimes you can just look at people's uh, setups here like this and kind of get an idea. Like people are using these deer blinds now right here for their imaging huts. So they can kind of run white lights and brighter lights inside these things and the light doesn't get out and you have a bunch of people yelling at you, which will happen. I promise you that if you turn on your headlights or uh, the, hit the wrong switch in your tent, you're going to get some uh, you, <laughs> you're going to get some shouts. Uh, but uh, that's the way it goes, because people drive a long way to get that true, truly dark skies. But um, I know, Eddie, you you go to uh, Okie Tech almost every year with us, man. And so I don't know, maybe you can tell us a little bit about you know, your thoughts on this thing. Uh, I'm, I agree with you hundred percent. Well, that's the darkest skies that I have ever experienced. And I've been to Texas star party. I've been to El Dorado, which are great star parties, but this uh, location has the darkest skies I've ever been under. Uh, I've seen some wonderful things. We were talking about Capricorn. It's always up this time of year, and I'm always amazed at how big that constellation is. Every time I look up for it, when I first get out, it's like, oh, my gosh, I forgot it was so huge. But uh, there is a lot to do. There's miles and miles of hiking. Uh, you can get to three corners, uh, three states in one spot, and there's a there's a, an obelisk there. In fact, Howard, I saw him walk to another state to pick flowers to give to Jane in <laughs> back in Oklahoma. He walked through Colorado and into what's the third state up there? New, New Mexico. New Mexico to pick flowers. And then he walked back to Colorado and then back into Oklahoma. It was amazing. That's a long walk, but it's worth it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and, that, and, and you Clayton. were talking about, uh, Outreach earlier, a star party is just like outreach on another level. I mean, you can go talk to anybody, and I guarantee you, everybody you meet knows something that you don't know. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, you get to hang out with people that that know way more than you. And Courtney was like, take a picture of me in front of this coffee shop. And I'm like, okay. And I have this thing where I troll her where I run video instead of taking a picture of her, um, which is always fun because then she's like, did you take it? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and then I just let her sit there, but it's fun. But yeah, like like Eddie said, it's just it's a it's a beautiful star party. You are kind of doing outreach with your fellow astronomers, even though you know, again, some of them are you know people that are that have better equipment than you. Um, it's still you know they may have never seen this particular object with that particular filter or something. You know what I mean? Like, there's all kinds of stuff like that, and they have these flamingos, which is hilarious. Those are up on top of the hill. You can see there. You get a nice close up and. Uh, so you can check your telescope's collimation on flamingos, which I don't think you can do very many places. And Howard, you've been going to Okie Tex for a long, long time, right? When, what was your first Okie Tex? Do you, do you remember how far back that was? I think it was 2003. And um, then um, pretty much hit every one of them up through 2010. And then maybe I missed one there, and um, but I've been to uh, I think ten Oki Techs, and um, so excellent, great, great time. Yeah, and I mean, so you know, they had these talks at the tent, and then they do giveaways and stuff, which is always great. Uh, so you can try your luck and see how lucky you are, and maybe win uh, a pair of binoculars or a star chart or something. You never know. So that's always fun. All these major star parties have giveaways and talks, though. Not this year, but we're going to talk about that in a second because I think what we'll do now is um, I will definitely see all of y'all at the Okie Tex 2021. I didn't, we're obviously, none of us are going this year, uh, but there is always 2021. And so let's hope that we can uh, get a vaccine or get rid of this thing, uh, hopefully before then, and we can all go back to sharing some photon time out in the, uh, in the wilderness there. Um, so what I'll do here is I will remove that and we'll go straight back into the 
Solar Report, which is... Okay, I don't know why that's supposed to say Solar Report on it, but it doesn't. So that's a massive fail. Oh, now it says it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I'm not even showing my screen. I apologize, guys. Um, let me get rid of that and just add this here. So this is the what we what we really need to be looking at here. <laughs> uh, so, Eddie, what in the world has been going on with the sun, man? Which is a dumb statement, but... <laughs> well, if you remember uh, last month, we had several sunspots throughout the month. We even we had days with double sunspots, and we had even a day that was possibly a triple sunspot. Uh, this this month was quite a bit quieter, and as you can see on this uh, little chart, we're still coming out of a solar minimum. And uh, as with all minimums, as we're coming out, they're going to fluctuate back and forth before they get really rolling. Mm. So let's go ahead and see what happened uh, the last 30 days. So here we are down here in our meeting. And as you can see, all these white boxes, blank, blank sun. Wow. This was our last meeting. And here, here was a double sunspot day, a single sunspot day. Then we went blank. We had one sunspot for four days since then, and uh, I, I think we've had uh, 21 spotless days since here. Wow. So it's, it's been kind of quiet. So let's look to see what we had. Uh, the sunspot that showed up like a few days after our meeting on the 18th of last month uh, was 2772, and it's a, a cycle 25 sunspot, so it's a it's one of the current cycle sunspots, and uh, it was in the northern hemisphere. It didn't roll around a limb. It, it actually appeared right in the middle of the sun. So here's a magnetogram of it, and uh, that's where it appeared. You know, normally we see them coming off, coming on as the sun rotates. But this one started right there, and it went on for, I think, four days, so there was the next day, and you can see it kind of developed a little bit, and uh, then it started to change even more. Then it started to dissipate right before it rolled off the edge of the sun, and that was our sunspot for the month. <laughs> so, wow. what else happened on the sun? Very interesting thing. On the 16th, uh, we had a B1 class solar flare which is a very minor flare class. I mean, it is the lowest class you can get. The interesting thing about this solar flare is it lasted about two and a half hours. And uh, it caused a coronal mass ejection that uh, hit us four days later, five days later on the 20th. It didn't hit us, it grazed us. So let's look and see what happened there. So there's a picture of it. Uh, there's a, the Earth for scale. Uh, there was no sunspot involved there. It was just a, a solar flare. And it threw off a pretty good size coronal mass ejection. So I think I've got a little video of it right here. It's going to happen right down here. And I apologize for this video in advance. Uh, for some reason, it blacks out like that several times. So we're going to see it right here. So Eddie, that when it when it blacks out, Eddie, that's the Earth actually getting in the way of the sun. Okay, uh, yeah, it's nighttime. Yes, kinda, I guess. <laughs> it's like an eclipse. So it's hard to see there, and it's it's even harder to understand that that lasted two and a half hours. So I've got a maybe a better video of it if I can figure out how to get past it. Here we go. Uh, let's see. There. This is it right here. So you can see the banding kind of take place. And then uh, here it comes. Bam. Wow. So that was a, a flare associated with a prominence. And the prominence is what blew off into space and caused the... the CME. 
So here's an interesting video that shows uh, this is the sun, here's the earth, this is the stereo A satellite and the stereo B satellite, and then here's a, a cross section of it. So, oh gosh. <laughs> there. You can see that coronal mass ejection, it, it just missed us. Wow. I mean, it grazed us. It, it didn't really cause any problems here. Uh, it, it, it was uh, responsible for some aurora, and that was about it. But, I mean, if that thing would have been a little bit on, it was, like I said, it lasted two and a half hours, and it threw a lot of material at us. So that was one interesting thing that happened outside of sunspots. Uh, and another interesting thing, on the 26th, 27th, and 28th, uh, a comet flew into the sun. It, uh, it committed suicide, I guess. It just blew into the sun, and we're going to see it. It's going to come into the frame right down here. And this type of comet is called a Kreutz sun grazer. Uh, there it is right there. And a Kreutz sun grazer, they, they theorize it. It's, the, it's, it's, it's a group of comets that orbits, and they, they speculate that uh, it's the remnants of a comet that disintegrated thousands of years ago. And there's several of these class of comets in the sky, some very famous ones. Uh, but this one was just one that ended up flying into the sun and didn't make it back out. So this is uh, the sun's behind here. Actually, the sun's very small, that's, that's the corona. And you can see another CME coming off there. And there, there's people that say, well, did the comet cause the CME? And uh, the answer to that is just a definite no, it did not. It doesn't have the size or mass to cause the sun to blow off billions of tons of uh, solar material. So, yeah, interesting. But that's it. So here's today, we got a blank sun. And it's been blank for 21 of the last 30 or so days. Wow. But, uh, you know, that it's solar minimum. We're coming out of it. We're definitely coming out of it because we see new cycle sunspots. Uh, the key here is uh, just keep looking up. <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. That's, a, that's a very short cycle, uh, solar cycle report for uh, September. Uh, maybe next month we'll, we'll get some better sunspots. Yeah. And that's the way it goes. You know, like we can't really, you know, as astronomers, we're just observers, you know, we don't get to really decide, you know, what the sun does. Uh, obviously the sun does that, but uh, this is the way it goes. You can, and you can see here on Eddie's graph, you know, back in 2011, uh, you know, the 20, well, 2013, 2014, we had a pretty nice, pretty good cycle, not as good as the the one before, but what they're predicting with that yellow line is, I guess, the the one coming up, and it looks pretty similar to the um, to the last solar cycle, twenty four, right? Yeah, yeah. They uh, they they bunch of solar scientists got together and they, they compared notes, and that was the prediction. Uh, the peak will be sometime in July of twenty twenty five, and it it's like you said, it'll be very similar to solar cycle twenty four. Which will be great because we all know that we have an eclipse coming up in what less than four years, uh, twenty twenty four, right? Uh, at the very beginning of twenty twenty four, so we should have some sunspots to help us focus our telescopes on that that day. Hopefully, yeah, uh, yeah because you know, have you, if, has anybody ever tried to do solar observing when there's no sunspots and you're trying to focus your telescope on nothing? You know, it's just the, the edge of the sun is really all you have. And that that can be very challenging. Um, so when you get some sunspots out there, it's definitely um, it's definitely something that you want to take advantage of for sure. Uh, let's see what we got here. There we go. Uh, this is uh, one more video that I, I couldn't incorporate this because it's uh, the type of video that it is. I couldn't put it into the uh, report. But here's that B1 class flare. And uh, on this video, you can actually see some of the solar material that gets blown off. It's coming right at us. So it's, 
it's very wispy, but I mean, that's billions of tons of solar material. Yeah, it looks like nothing, right? But like you said, it's probably like Mount Everest worth of material coming at us or more. Maybe yeah. a couple of Mount Everest worth of material. <laughs> yeah, and, and like I said, that was a very minor uh, solar flare, B1. I mean, they're, they're, they're classified, the strongest solar flares are X class. And then a mag order of magnitude below that is an M class. And then below that's a C class. And then even below that's a B class. And so that's what this one was. The only thing that made it significant was the duration. Interesting. Yeah. And like you said, that could have been, that could have been, uh, you know, a pretty, pretty interesting event had it hit us direct on. And then Eddie, before we went live, you were saying that, uh, we're actually at the anniversary of the Carrington event, right? Yeah. Uh, in, in 18, uh, 50, 60. Oh, sorry. 1859, okay. years ago this month. They had the Carrington event, which was a, a massive solar flare, and a, a British astronomer, uh, Mr. Carrington, saw it on the, <laughs> on the day that it happened, and so he sketched it, and you know that that solar flare ended up frying telegraph wires. It it, it had a pretty big impact on our technology at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, there was aurora seen as far down as Cuba and the Bahamas and Hawaii. Uh, we didn't have the technology then that we have now, so we don't know what a solar flare of that class would do. And uh, there's also studies that indicate that those Carrington size events are not as uh, rare as we thought they were. We thought, well, you know, once every couple hundred years, but. Uh, they're, they're starting to look at other parts of the world that have had reporting of events that caused aurora of that, of that magnitude. And they're saying, well, you know, if you compare the aurora quality, it was similar to the Carrington event. Well, it was one that happened in, uh, in Japan in, in the 1700s, in 1770. But it didn't happen in Japan. It happened on the sun. But people in Japan recorded it. Right. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. That would. It would have been a, a little bit different day had it happened in Japan uh, yeah. versus being observed from Japan, right? But right. yeah, and that's the thing is, you know, we have all these these millennia of observations of the sky from Chinese ancient astronomers, Arabic ancient astronomers, Japanese, Native American uh, astronomers from right here in New Mexico and some other places that saw supernovae and they knew very well the movements of the sky. So these, these people were not, you know, just, you know, people wandering around out in the wilderness. They were very intelligent people uh, who were keeping track of stuff, which I think is fascinating. So that's awesome, Eddie. And there was a question for you here from uh, Mr. Starlink himself, Travis, who is uh, basically responsible for the Starlink satellites. So we can all, thank him for the horribleness that that is that it's just, it's a joke by the way but uh <laughs> travis says forgive my ignorance sunspots are good uh well travis sunspots are not good and they're not bad they're just a phenomenon that happens on the sun and they're fun to look at and uh we try to record them as best we can on earth and what we've noticed over the years in fact uh i've got a i've got a graph that shows that that sine wave that goes back several hundred years. That's how long we've been recording them. And what we've noticed is that we go through an 11 year cycle of uh, a maximum number of sunspots and a minimum number of sunspots. And so uh, you may have heard me say earlier that we're coming out of the solar minimum, which uh, we're right coming out of that trough of minimum amount of sunspots. And then uh, it's predicted that in 2025, we'll be hitting that peak. So every 11 years, we go through that cycle. But to answer your questions, sunspots are not good. They're not bad. They, they're just a phenomenon that we observe. Yeah, and they can be bad, I guess, though. It could, it could uh, you know, be a bad thing for us. But again, like Eddie said, it has to be a lot of the right conditions uh, or the wrong conditions, I guess, right? whichever way you want to look at it, really. But well, uh, you you may be meaning like a solar flare, right? 
solar flare is a different phenomenon than a sunspot. And a solar right. flare, again, it's not good or bad. It's just it might affect our technology on Earth. Uh, we see aurora, and you would say those are good. So, you know, if we had a solar flare that put a lot of X-ray material and solar material, and and it hit the Earth straight on, it it could damage some of our uh, electrical equipment. Yeah, it, it could hurt us. Yeah, and uh, Travis says so. Sunspots are more of just an indicator of fusion or something like that. Really, what they're an indicator of, Travis, is magnetic activity on the sun. Um, they all have, they're all either uni, unipolar, either they have a north or a south pole, or they have both. Uh, and it usually depends on whether they're in the northern hemisphere of the sun or the southern hemisphere of the sun. And these are just places of magnetic activity where the magnetic field lines of the sun have become so twisted and just, you know, ripped apart and, you know, tried to break the sun's trying to break the magnetic, you know, stuff going on in there, but it gets twisted instead because you can't break a magnetic field, right? But what happens is, is that material gets pulled up from the surface of the sun and it gets cooled down because of that. And so it's only slightly cooler than the, I mean, you, we'd all be vaporized if you went into a sunspot, right? But it's just a, an indicator that there is a lot of magnetic activity at that particular point and that that material is kind of coming up uh, from, from the photosphere, which is, you know, the surface or whatever you want to call that, that area of the sun. Um, but again, yeah, so if we see a lot of sunspots, we know that the sun is very active. Um, and if you see no sunspots, like what Eddie reported here just a few seconds ago, the sun's kind of kind of napping. You know, it's kind of it's it's hitting the snooze button a lot this year, it seems like, uh, because it kind of woke up and it was like, yeah, you know, no, and it hit the snooze button again. I think it's probably in nap time right now. So uh, but they're fascinating objects and the intricate details you can see, like with, pe you know, with the telescopes that Eddie and I have and stuff like that, it's just fantastic. Uh, there's all kinds of little phenomena you can see in and around the sunspots themselves, which is really cool. Uh, and then he says, Travis says, oh, okay, gotcha. I think I remember hearing that the upper layer cools as more energy is being released. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So you've got that material that you're taking from the sun. And if you pull it up, it cools down because it's not on that photosphere anymore. And so it appears darker. But I think I've heard the sunspot off the sun and put it out in space. It would be brighter than any full moon that you could ever observe just be, just on its own merit is that hot. Uh, but relatively to the rest of the sun, it just, it, it appears cooler. I think, right. Did I get that right, gentlemen? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's exactly right. You have to remember when we're looking at the sun, we're looking at just a, a very small percentage of the light that's coming to us. And so, with that in mind, the sunspots appear dark, but you're absolutely right. If you were to put them alone in space, they'd still be brighter than anything else, the moon or anything else that we see. Don't try that, though. Yeah. Uh, no one should try to put a, uh, <laughs> one of those in space. That'd be a bad day for all of us, I'm sure. Uh, and then Travis says, okay, awesome knowledge. You guys are getting me uh, more interested in what I'm trying to block you guys from seeing. You guys are awesome. Hey, good luck with Starlink trying to block the sun, though, Travis. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. I think you you got an uphill battle there, my friend. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, maybe in August. In August in Texas, we might welcome that just a little bit. Exactly. I was, yeah, man, because, man, whew. We could use some cool weather down here for sure. Um, yeah, something. Uh, so as we're kind of wrapping up towards the end here, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about, and thank you, Eddie, by the way, that was an amazing, uh, I love the way you lay that out on the calendar so we can really see, you know, how active or inactive it's it's been been doing and the, the, that stuff that you added on there is fantastic. So great job, Eddie. Thanks. Um, as, as we're kind of wrapping her down here, uh, I did want to talk about the El Dorado Star Party, which, by the way, if uh, if you've been paying attention or not, you probably realize that the, the pandemic has canceled everything. Um, basically, everything has been canceled um, except for the El Dorado Star Party. Believe it or not, this star party is going forward. Um, this is one of my favorite star parties. It's not quite as dark 
uh, as far as like the sky goes, uh, as Oki Tex or Texas Star Party, but it's just under that. Um, and you get a little bit more amenities because of that, right? That means you have um, towns nearby that you can kind of go to and restock your groceries if need be. Uh, the El Dorado Star Party was my first major star party um, past the Hodges Garden Star Party. You know, I kept hearing from people like Howard and all the people in our club. You got to go to El Dorado. You got to go to El Dorado. So I was like, fine, I'm going to go to El Dorado. And that was in 2011. And uh, it turned out to be one of my absolute favorite star parties ever. Uh, and real quick, Travis says, uh, I'll try to work on a sunshade night, guys. Have a good one, Travis. And thanks for... Thanks for making Star Limp a little bit dimmer for us. We appreciate that, brother. Uh, but this is a great star party, and everyone here on the panel with me tonight, um, including Jane, uh, was is a regular at the uh, El Dorado Star Party, basically. And um, you know, like I said, this year there is you know you can see the coronavirus and ESP up there, so you can click on that for more information. If you do want to go to this star party, this is next month, so the next exact full or new moon cycle that we're in right now. Just think next new moon cycle. And, uh, it, it, you know, it's about, what, three hours west of San Antonio on Interstate 10 through Texas, if you're going that way. <laughs> um, and so it's not far. It's not that bad. Um, and uh, there are certain accommodations there. A lot of the accommodations, like the cabins and stuff, fill up pretty quickly. Uh, but if you have an RV, a tent, uh, or something like that, maybe you want to stay in one of the towns that's nearby, you can for sure do that kind of stuff. Uh, but it is an awesome star party. And what I want to do here is, uh, what I'll do is I'll remove that and then I'll pull up what, what I think is really cool that a lot of the star parties do that I didn't really get to discuss in the last one is they do these observing club awards. Um, so essentially like Astronomical League, you go to a star party, and uh, while you're at that star party, if you observe these list of objects, you get a certificate and a pin. Well, I think it's just a pin for uh, El Dorado. And let me bring that up here. And you can see kind of the rules here, the sort of the uh, what the theme of the year is. They always have some sort of theme. This one's flying high over X bar, which I love that. It's so cool. Bill Flanagan does a great job with these. You see that Bill Flanagan right here. He's the man. Um, and then you got all the objects right here in sort of a, you know, a form uh, style. And you can see that like the type going down, you've got variable stars, open clusters, uh, Myra class stars, planetary nebulas, dark nebulas, galaxies. Uh, you got the, you got a whole mixed bag of fun stuff. And that's Bill always uh, has a good time putting these together. I know he does. And he's always a year ahead of it. He does a great job putting them together. I mean, I remember uh, last year while I was working on the year's list, him and uh, Gene were set up next to us, and they were putting together next year's list. And they, you could hear him critiquing all the all the different things they were looking at. But it's kind of neat to uh, see the process they would go through putting this list together. They put a lot into it. They they look at a lot of stuff before they put it on paper. Absolutely. Yeah. And what's cool is, you know, Eddie and I and, and Howard and everybody, we set up at the lodge field. That's where we observe at the El Dorado star party. There's two main observing fields, the main field and the lodge field. And we're at the lodge field. And uh, that's where Bill Flanagan sets up too. And uh, like, like Eddie said, he's always out there working on next year's list, which is fun uh, mm -hmm. because we get kind of like that sneak peek, right? Cause Bill, <laughs> Bill will be like, Hey, come over here and check this out real quick. And we're like, okay. And, what do you see? You know, look at it. Well, kind of a fuzzy thing with a, I don't know, you know, and so we kind of, that's kind of like all night for us. We're always calling each other over to our scopes and stuff like that, which is, uh, which is awesome. But the cool thing about this award is all you really have to do is either do it yourself or with a friend log date, which you can see is that first blank column there to the right and log time. So the night you saw it and the time that you saw it, that's it. And I believe the rule is uh, you have to observe 20 objects on this list uh, to get the award or let's see, 28 objects. Uh, yeah. So probably about 20, I think is the rule. Uh, I always do all of them. can, you know, I mean, you might as well, if you're, if you're out and about, you might as well do them all. I mean, you can look at the constellation that these things are in 
uh, all sorted down here through this center line or whatever. You can see Aquila, Cygnus, uh, Cygnus, 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 Cygnus. I mean, look, look from here all the way up here, everything's in Cygnus. So, I mean, that's, you know, you're just hopping around the same constellation, which is pretty awesome. You got a few Pegasus down here. Um, and, but again, Bill, Bill does a really good job with these. And then each object he has here has a nice little explanation of what it is, uh, you know, what you might be looking for. Um, he, I mean, he has Elberio on here, which is a very famous double star. Um, and he says, we've been doing this since 2003 and we've never included Alberio, which is pretty funny. Uh, but that's the way it goes. And this is one of my favorite objects of all time right here. Campbell's hydrogen star or RO 11. Uh, and I was super uh, excited and uh, stuff to see that on this list, which I think is fantastic. So Bill, if you're out there somewhere listening to us, great job, buddy. Good job. We always appreciate these. Um, now I have several awards. Eddie, do you have any of the pins from these, uh, from these awards or I actually do. Uh, when I first started going to star parties, I was uh, more focused on working in the astronomical league programs. I really was wanting to complete them. But uh, what I've discovered is that these star parties happen at the same time every year. So after a few years, you've kind of seen everything that you need to see for astronomical league awards. So these lists are a lot of fun. And what's really fun about them is that, uh, you know, you're talking about they're all in Cygnus. Yeah, that might be true, but there's going to be two or three in there that you're not going to be able to see unless you stay up to three or four in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of stuff that you might have to stay up late for. But hey, when you're out there all week, there's going to be more than like Howard said, a lot of those nights are all nighters. Yeah, uh, it's midnight before you even realize it. Uh, and you're like, why well, am I tired? It's, oh, it's one 30 in the morning. Okay, cool. You know? And then you, like you said, you go back to have a little cup of hot cocoa or coffee or whatever it may be. And you're ready to go. And this is sort of a, one of my videos from El Dorado itself. This is the X bar ranch, a very famous ranch, uh, out in West Texas. And, uh, this is the main field here. The field I started off on was the lodge field. Uh, and you can see all the, the spots out there here. We're back on the lodge field again. Again, these videos are all on my YouTube channel. So if you want to watch them in depth and get a little bit more, you know, of a, of a look at it, you can always watch it there, of course. And, uh, there it is X bar ranch, the Metter family, one of my favorite families of all time. If, if I had favorite families, I guess, uh, they're an awesome group of people that let us take over their ranch and uh, do things like this, wear a, um, an eagle costume and walk around with American flags or put telescopes on their property and stare into the sky endlessly. That's what they love it for us to do. Yeah. And, uh, so I always like to shoot video of my friends acting weird out in the dark and uh, going to talks. There's Bill Wren. He was one of our guest speakers uh, last year. There's a, uh, that was um, Bill's setup right there. And uh, Gene and uh, some of his friends were out there observing those very objects, just like we said. And I have real-time video, by the way, of a lightning storm that came through last year. And that was the most intense thing uh, I've ever experienced. Uh, yeah. I've, I've seen a lot of lightning storms, Eddie, and you were there. That was insane. Yeah, that was uh, the lightning storm that caused Lonnie to disappear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and speaking of Lonnie, here, here he is. He said 145 people attended El Dorado Star Party last year. That's right. Usually between 100 and 160, 170 people or so kind of spread out all over this ranch, and uh, which is a beautiful thing. But yeah, that, that bolt came from, from the sky to the ground, and it was right next to us. Lonnie's, Lonnie's was sitting in a rocking chair, and I saw it, and I was kind of like, whoa, what was that? And I looked over to see what Lonnie was thinking, and his chair was just moving. And I'm like, where, where did he go? Like, did he disappear <laughs> into heaven? Did, did that thing happen? But no, he was in the lodge. <laughs> I mean, what, what, you saw the flash of light, you heard the boom, and then you heard the screen door slam. <laughs> <laughs> and it was awesome. I mean, but, you know, we were all, my wife was in the camper and she was texting me like, am I going to die in here tonight? And I was like, you know, you might, I don't know. I don't know what's coming. But it was an intense, um, if you watch the, the, the film that I made about that year, you'll see that we were out observing that night. 
it was one of those nights where you go out and you're like, this is going to be a great night. Like, like the sky you see here, sapphire blue, beautiful sky. We're like, man, we're going to be observing all night. There was no rain predicted. There was nothing like a storm predicted. And then we saw this cloud form. Actually, the direction we're looking right now is where the clouds started forming. We started saying like, what, what's going on over there? You know, we're like, ah, okay, whatever. We'll, you know, if it, if it gets weird, we'll, we'll take off. And then the first lightning dropped and then the second and then the third. And so we all started kind of panicking, kind of trying to pack up all of our stuff to get it storm ready. You can see Lonnie setting up his uh, wooden telescope out there. Mine's in the little foreground. We got my buddy Mark Farage over there to the left. And we're all kind of, this is like set up where we kind of set up our stuff. And <laughs> Lonnie says, I thought I was the goner. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good, it's a good way to put it, Lonnie. But I mean, yeah, it was pretty intense. I'm not going to lie. Um, Lonnie, we, you did what we all wanted to do. You were just quicker at it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we all knew we needed to seek shelter, but we were like, what in the world was that? You know, Lonnie yeah. already knew and was gone. He was yeah. he was already like halfway home writing us a letter, basically. Uh, and uh, but you can see like, you know, there's the lodge field before really anybody gets there. We all kind of set up our stuff. And and uh, again, these videos are on YouTube. You can go through and kind of check them out as you wish. Uh, but one one thing I will, while we're here, we'll check out this lightning storm that was sort of came out of nowhere on us. And uh, you can see our gear out there. Now, this was right before the heavy rains started. Uh, when the heavy rains started, uh, it got real. It got real, real quick. Um, we had people from the, uh, the main field coming up and uh, seeking shelter with us. That was my buddy Andy all the way from England who came out to the X-Bar Ranch just for the uh, El Dorado Star Party there. Uh, brilliant photographer, great guy Andy is. Uh, and... Um, but yeah, Lonnie's telescope actually blew over during this storm. I mean, you see Lonnie right there. There he is in his old rocking chair. Just wait. He's waiting for the bolt. <laughs> and uh, you can see uh, Katie Dog sitting there on Eddie's lap. And I think Katie handled it better than Lonnie did. I don't know, Eddie. I, I think she went inside way before it, it all got really bad. She doesn't like storms. Yeah. And this was a good one. Like I said, I've been out in West Texas many, many times. I don't think I've ever seen a storm this active before. And maybe it, it just was, it had been a long time since my last one, but you can see here, I'm going back and forth between iPhone footage and night vision. Um, it was just a absolutely intense storm. And then after it rained in the front past us, all the clouds went past us. We were treated to an all night long light show. As we watched these clouds roll off to the East, we had an unlimited view of the horizon. So all night long, these things went off to the east and just lit up the whole sky. I think there were tornadoes that went through Dallas during this particular storm when it finally reached that way. Uh, and then, right, it was cold after this, wasn't it? I feel like we got like a really nice cold snap after this. Yeah, yeah, I seem to remember that. I, I wouldn't say cold, but it was definitely cooler, chilly. We had, we had to put on some extra layers. Yeah. And you can see kind of um, all of our setups out there. This is filmed from the lodge out onto the lodge field. And uh, you can sort of see our setups out there with the, the rain. And this is real-time video, y'all. This is not a time lapse or anything like that. This is real-time video from my night vision camera um, of <laughs> that storm that came through. And Lonnie says, you could see this storm for 100 miles or so after it passed. That's exactly right, man. It just kept rolling on and on and on out there. And it was... What was really amazing is, like you said earlier, it came out of nowhere. And we started looking at the radar, and all of a sudden, these clouds started forming on the radar, and it was coming right at us. We've yeah. seen storms at star parties in the distance in the past. I mean, you're in the middle of nowhere, so if there's a storm within 100 miles, you're going to see it. This one came right over us. Yeah. Now, Howard, you've been to El Dorado many, many times. Right. Do you ever remember anything quite like this? Or, uh... well, I, of course, I wasn't there for this, but um, uh, maybe 2017, 2014. Seems like 20, one of those in there, 2014, 2015, had a heck of a light storm in the north. And um, it was, I mean, it was beautiful. We got, I still got pictures of the cloud formations up there. Yeah. And it really turned golden and 
and it looked like to me up toward El Dorado that uh, there were funnel clouds hanging out of the wall cloud down below. I don't wow. think they hit the ground, but it sure looked like funnel clouds uh, underneath the wall. And uh, but the lightning and it had the it was just right at sundown and the uh, light show was fantastic with the sun shining on the clouds from underneath and with them all bellowed up and that kind of stuff. So I think everybody yeah. who's done a few star parties has a witnessed, you know, some some kind of a storm at one time or another. No, you're absolutely right. In fact, 2018 Okie Tex will now forever be known as the Soki Tex uh, because we observed for two hours in 10 days. That was it. Wow. Yeah, that was that was a pretty rough year, but, um, you know, typically that doesn't happen. Typically, um, if you're there for five, 10 days, you're going to get a night or two at least. Uh, of observing if not the other way where you're by midweek you're like so tired of astronomy that you're ready to sell your telescope or something you know but um that's not true ever for me but um you weren't you weren't at okie tech for the hurricane were you the year that was that was before my time howard on hurricane okie techs for sure yeah it blew my, blew my scope over on its side and luckily it blew it over away from where the found finder was mounted and that kind of stuff but it uh, it hit pretty good but set it back up and realign the optics and it's ready to go but uh, yeah it had a pretty good bump <laughs> yeah and there's bill flanagan and his crew of uh hoodlums and shenanigan peoples doing some <laughs> astronomy gene briles there to the left and i think that's uh, maybe lloyd was sitting down before gene sat down there there's gene briles friend of ours from Colorado drives all the way down from Colorado to the X bar ranch, come out and observe with us, which is pretty awesome. Gene's a, awesome. Gene's a great guy. Yeah. There's it's a, a great star party. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I had to walk down a lonely walk to the gate that night uh, by myself to go get that shot, which, you know, it's not that far, but uh, you know, I, I mean, you're in the, it's in the dark out there. So yeah, sometimes there's critters, there is critters. <laughs> there's, there's critters. critters. Those raccoons will hunt you at night. I, I, I can attest to this. That little bush right there to the bottom right-hand side of the screen, they love that little bush, uh, and you'll hear them out there. And uh, they always make themselves sound bigger than they are at night. So just You're to let you know. You're worried that one of them is a wild pig. Yeah, which I've had happen to me at Texas Star Party once before. That was not fun. A uh, whole family of uh, wild hogs. I guess it may have even been javelina. Uh, normally it's feral hogs, but I think in this case it was javelina. Uh, but that was a pretty unnerving experience where I was walking back to my camper at night and uh, these things came out of the stall. But, uh, you know, normally sometimes you only really have to worry about the wildlife like bald eagles flying around sometimes. Um you know, it was Halloween, so I guess I'll give Mark the benefit of the doubt there for uh, the Halloween costume. <laughs> but uh, it's a fantastic star party, y'all. I wanted to highlight it here because, look, it is the only star party that's going forward in 2020, uh, for better or worse. I don't know. There are rules. You know, you got to set your scope up good 15 feet from other scopes, uh, which you can't really do what you're, what you're seeing here. Although these scopes are further apart than they appear. Um, this is, this is on the main field where there's a lot of imaging going on. Uh, a lot of my friends down there are doing some incredible imaging, um, and, and just doing incredible work down there. Some of their images that they've taken at the X bar ranch is phenomenal, phenomenal stuff. Um, at night there's a, a warming tent, which now it's a warming building. There's a, a permanent building there where you can get hot cocoa, coffee, snacks, and it's all on the honor system. You just drop a buck or two in the, in the jar and, warm up, go back and finish your observing or, you know, what you're imaging or whatever you were doing and you're all good. But, um, again, if you get bored, I, I recommend grabbing your favorite beverage of choice, maybe some popcorn and sitting down with, uh, these star party videos that I make They're pretty much a chronological journey through the star party. Um, and where I just like to show people doing what they do out there because this kind of stuff isn't as widely you know publicized or known there's andy at his imaging rig 
you know, you notice the imagers spend a lot of time looking into their computer screens. And then, you know, us visual guys spend a lot of time looking into the eyepiece. And um, you can see Orion there again. Orion's a very prominent feature at the El Dorado Star Party, which is always fun. And we look at the Horsehead Nebula a lot, which is seems like it's like, a, you know, one of our go-to hard objects, if you will. Uh, there's my buddy Alan Mitchell right there from Dallas, Texas, sitting down at his, uh, at his setup. They, both Andy and Alan are hardcore imagers. Again, Andy came all the way from England uh, just to do some imaging in West Texas. And he had a great time, even though there was a little bit of uh, that rainstorm and stuff like that. But it was a banner year, uh, as far as I remember, last year. Um, yeah. And hopefully we get another good year. There's Justin Daniel, uh, his ridiculous rig. Guys, that mount is worth more than my car. <laughs> um and uh you know then you've got well, now we're back on the other field we've got lonnie mosley there uh mark farage brandon hamill david clark of uh, tsp fame just the whole crew all down there doing the thing um you'll even see eddie in here in a minute i think maybe Andy, maybe even cat but you know this is what we do we go out we explore the night sky we look at objects through uh you know analog and digital methods this is the night vision that my buddy mark has uh which allows you to film the pillars of creation with an iphone which is ridiculous uh never some, never some, thought that'd be something that i'd be doing for fun um but there it is you know we're looking at planetary we're looking at globulars we're looking at whatever we can uh out there and so i encourage y'all to come join us uh it's a great star party if you register before I think the 23rd, I believe, um, you'll get in for 45 bucks. Whereas I, I don't think they're doing any at the door registration this year. They're, they're not supposed to be doing any uh, day of registrations. Right. So you'll want to get your registration in beforehand, which I'm looking on the site now is September 20. So you have nine days to get your registration in. For the El Dorado Star Party 2020, the only Star Party of 2020. Can y'all believe that? That is nuts to me. And there's the horse head right there. There's, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, we spend so much time visually trying to find this thing, and here I am filming it with an iPhone uh, through night vision, which is absurd. Yeah, that, that's through Mark's night vision, and and that's the only way that I've been able to see the horse head. I've never seen it without that enhancement. Oh, I didn't know that, Eddie. Wow. Yeah, we're gonna work on that this year for you. You know, I've had I've I've sat down and I've looked and looked and looked, but unless I see it as good as I saw it in that night vision, it, it's I won't yeah. see it. Yeah, I, I'll try. Yeah, we'll we'll get it. We'll we'll get you there. I mean, and there you can see the whole Bernard's loop. Uh, this is me holding you know the night vision up with an H alpha or H beta filter. Sorry, um, you can see the California Nebula there uh, next to the Pleiades which is absurd. Uh, that's not, that's not possible, but here I am, uh, videoing it with an iPhone. Uh, so you never know what you're going to be able to see. And I think Mark Farage, my good friend is going to be out there with us this year and I'm sure he'll have his, uh, his, uh, night vision on him. So, uh, if you've never looked through a night vision monocular like this through a telescope or just one X as we call it, or one, one time magnification, you got to come by and, and meet Mark and, uh, and get a load of that view because wow, it is just amazing what you yeah, can see. Mark's, with that thing. Mark's always got the the real hard stuff to see. He's always got a list of things. Hey, look at this. You've never seen this before. And he's yeah. right, you know. <laughs> yeah, Einstein's like the, cross. Yes. Yeah, we got to see Einstein's cross with the night vision and without. Yeah. Yep. But Mark likes to look at the super faint stuff because a lot of us have seen the Orion Nebula right here, for instance, you know ad nauseum we've seen it more times than we care to admit um so it's fun sometimes to kind of dig a little deeper and get a little get a little weirder with the objects you know you might be able to see hoag's object even you know who knows what whatever's up but um again it's just a it's a it's a great place you're gonna learn a lot going to an event like this uh it's something that i can't recommend enough we spend a, quite a bit of time there's eddie and his set right there there you go hmm. um it's something that, you know, it's truly something that you need to experience uh, because we can sit here and go on and on and on about it. But until y'all come out there with us and hang out, it's really, it's it's kind of hard to translate. So that's my encouragement uh, for you guys is to come out there and join us. Bring your masks, though, because there is a mask rule this year. And a red light. 
you know, you're looking at all this video. It looks like it's pretty bright out there. It's dark. And all yeah. these red bright lights you see, they're not as bright as they appear on this video. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and they're, they're, Howard's got his mask. There we go. He's ready for surgery, folks. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that, that's exactly right, Eddie. I'm like a lot of these night vision shots make it appear brighter than it is. But you're exactly right. It's uh, those red lights are super, super dim. You don't want to damage your night vision. But uh, yeah, epic that's stuff. Awesome. Great video here, Will. Yeah, thank you. That's a what? It's a little thing called the Psionics Aurora. It's a it's called a digital night vision, whereas my buddy Mark's is, I guess you could say, analog night vision, uh, maybe. But this is a digital night vision monocular, so it's it's actually in color. You can see the red lights are red, uh, and basically every other light's kind of a purplish, kind of infrared -y kind of look, though. Um, and then you can see some moments where I turn on what looks like a spotlight, but in reality, it's a small little flashlight that shoots infrared. So it's basically invisible to us humans, but to the camera, it creates like a Q beam effect. Like there might as well be a floodlight out there. Yeah. You just saw this gentleman, his eyes glowed. When yeah. He turned towards the yeah. That was Brandon Hamill. There was somebody, Gene lighting a cigarette back there and you saw it look like a supernova going off in the background. Uh, you know, it's just a small little lighter, you know, and, uh, but that little camera does a great job. And so that's, I like to get the nighttime footage. I think, you know, that star party videos are fun during the day, but I think at night, that's where the magic happens, right? That's when we're all out doing our thing. And uh, Bill Flanagan set up, Bill Flanagan has an amazing, I mean, he knows the wind speed direction. He knows temperature, dew point. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, when it gets cold, we're always like, Bill, what's the temperature? And he's like, 42. We're like, oh, no. <laughs> you know, and uh, Steve Muncie there, good buddy of mine from Houston. And uh, just great stuff, you know, uh, good stuff. So I encourage you again, come out and enjoy. There's a wine tasting, you know, like uh, on, on the win. Well, there might not be one this year. In fact, there, I know there, there won't, won't be, be one, one this year. No. There won't be one. But in 2021, you can bet that there will be probably a wine tasting again. We used to do it every two years anyway. And then I think it started becoming an every year thing at the Cristobal winery, which is right which there. Which is Bob a great Texas winery. They, they make some really good wines. They do. Their yeah. Tempranillo is amazing. Their Montepulciano is <laughs> But you have to say Montepulciano like that. So, um, and you, Howard, you and Jane have been to the wine tasting on more than one occasion, correct? Pretty sure. Correct. Yeah. Sometimes I, I send her with a mink because I'm not wine on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Howard, Howard doesn't like the, the strong drink, but he does enjoy the strong coffee, so. With strong yeah. cocoa, even. Yeah, and for some reason, my I friend Mark that. brought a kite. Sorry, Howard, go did. ahead. I love kites. <laughs> <laughs> did you see the kite where they picked up the girl over in Spain or somewhere? <laughs> had a big yeah. tail and grabbed the seven or eight-year-old girl and picked her up? <laughs> yeah, that'll happen. This one knocked, uh, knocked Mark over there. I don't know if y'all caught that. but Yeah, Mark, I saw that. Mark just fell on his booty, uh, you know, <laughs> making sure the kite stayed in the air. And I thought it'd be cool to fly a drone near a kite. So uh, that's what we did here. And it was pretty cool. I was able to give him his altitude and all that kind of stuff, which was pretty fun. Uh, but it ended up making a pretty awesome shot. We're almost like if you're a Harry Potter fan, like a Dementor. <laughs> yeah. or just kind of floating out there um, doing its yeah. thing. You don't see the string or anything. No, and even in the even in the video, if you're watching it on like a high def TV, it's just too small to see. Uh, I think I was at about three or 250, 300 feet here, uh, maybe a little less. And um, you know, he had that kite up for a good a good hour. I think he was flying that thing. So, and look, y'all, that thing is a big kite. It looks way bigger or way smaller than it is. It takes quite a bit of arm effort to keep that thing in check. Um, in fact, it's so much, I'm surprised that when he fell, he didn't just like hold on to the kite to stay afloat there, you know, and fall backwards and just hold on to the kite. It seems But um, again, Eldorado star party 2020 is going forward. Um, so I do hope that I get to see some of y'all out there. And if y'all have questions about star parties or, uh, any of these events or whatever it may be, you know, you can always reach out to either me or Eddie or Howard. 
uh, try to find us one way or another, send an email, throw a pigeon at us or something. And we'll, uh, don't literally throw a pigeon at us, but you know, you get what I'm saying, but, uh, we, we can answer your question as best as possible. I mean, we, like Howard said, he's been to thousands of these events and, um, you know, so we have, you know, a good combined, uh, lay of the land here as far as stuff goes. so we'd be more than happy to help y'all uh get out here for your first event this star party is one of the best for your first event i think uh yeah. it's an it's an intimate event there's uh you know less than 200 people there typically more than 100 so you get that balance where there's not a, an overwhelming amount of people but there's still a a respectable amount of people that you can learn from and kind of kind of um bounce ideas off of and stuff so and everyone is so friendly at the x-bar ranch stan meador and his family they're just so gracious and it's west texas you can see from this video there's there's a lot of hiking trails you can do there and i love west texas uh topography it's just great yeah i think they have seven thousand acres the metter family so um good luck hiking all that <laughs> be like lewis and clark out there discovering all kinds of new rivers and stuff if you went out there who knows what's out there we were out there one year and um everybody had gone home from the star party but we stayed on for a couple of nights jane and i did and stan came around to our trailer and he said well you guys are in charge there's nobody left on the ranch tonight they've all gone to um what is it up the road what is the thing? Abil not Abilene. What is it? Uh, they are, uh, they uh, San left. Angelo. Yeah, San Angelo. So they'd all gone to San Angelo, the whole family. And so he came by and told Jane and I we were in charge of the ranch, uh, 7,000 7, acres. And so <laughs> anyway, I went in the trailer and closed the door and locked it. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I was about to say that's a lot of responsibility, Howard. I mean, you know, mowing the grass on a half acre is, is too much. Seven thousand acres that might take a year or more. Uh, I need to get hold of Stan and uh, see if get her name on a list to see if we could get a cabin there for twenty one twenty twenty one. That would that would be great. Yeah, we definitely got to get you guys back out there. Uh, yeah. And, and get y'all back that, out, that back out the only way we could go is get a cabin yeah and and they do have that option guys for those of y'all that might want to go to the star party but they do fill up fast uh and there's there's uh you know people are like well i had it last year so i get it again right and it's kind of a thing like that so but if, a lot of people sometimes cancel or whatever it may be so you never know about availability it always is good to check um but again uh, if y'all have yeah, if y'all have any questions about any of that, again, get with get with one of us on the panel, and we'd be more than happy to uh, help y'all go through that. Um, that's all I have for the meeting tonight, uh, unless there's anything Howard or Eddie wants to add in toward the end here. I've got nothing, Will. Another great meeting. Yeah. Good job. Howard, thank you yeah, for showing up and for your Constellation to... Report. Um. I went and sprung for 65 bucks and I got the next eight X Y Z uh, phone adapter and for iPhones basically and yeah. other phones will work. And even my eight, my iPhone eight with a heavy and the, I have the large screen and it'll hold it and with a cover on it and so anyway wow. i just got this thing and so i've got it set up on my little bird spotting scope my 80 millimeter spotting scope and so i'm going to get some pictures at least of birds and might even get a picture of um, something up in the sky oh might, i might need to pick your brain well okay yeah. my brain is always available for picking so you're going to be like that meme that uh, Will had on earlier. I'm somewhat of a scientist myself when you yeah. take a picture of the moon. <laughs> well, I know that if Howard's pictures are any as good as near any nearly anywhere near as good. There we go. As his sketches, 
it'll be fantastic, man, because Howard's sketches almost look real, y'all. And I'm not even, I'm just, I'm not trying to like, you know, build it up to be something that it's not. They seriously are amazing. The angle, the lighting, the shading, spot on. Hey, uh, uh, yeah. All that sketching, uh, of course, I had some art classes and stuff in college, but it, um, I just always enjoyed that. And then, but the log, the, the deal on the advanced program of the moon, where you did craters and sketch craters and mountains there and grills and, and crater chains and all this kind of stuff. I really liked them. And so yeah. my moon certificate, advanced moon certificate, that was my best uh, program where I did sketching. And so I'll have Lunar to bring two, it right? in for so you guys can admire it. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe you should uh, take some pictures of uh, some random drawings, Howard, and we can maybe show that next month for the meeting, which I do want to mention before well, we I... go. Oh, go ahead, Howard. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say I already have some that I can put out, but uh, we'll, we may try that next time. Yeah, I think that'd be a lot of fun. Um, Kat says, great meeting. Love the presentations. Thank you, Kat. You are awesome. We appreciate Kat. She is uh, Eddie's significant other, better half, maybe even. I don't oh, know. definitely the better half. Me, better seventy five percent anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good to see Cat in here. And what I wanted to mention before we take off is, I'm looking at the calendar, and it looks like our meeting, which is the second Friday of every month, will occur during the El Dorado Star Party. Now, typically. What we do is we either have our vice president run the meeting. If we were in person, that's probably what we do. But I was thinking since we have th this whole pandemic thing going on and we've been doing, you know, uh, at home meetings anyway, what I thought would be fun for the first time ever in our club's history, uh, at least in our small club anyway, I thought it'd be fun to host a meeting from the El Dorado Star Party which again oh. is the only official event of 2020. And um, we have Wi-Fi at the ranch, but we, my wife and I also have like a little Wi-Fi hotspot, which typically works a little better. Um, so I thought it'd be a great idea to go out there uh, and host the meeting on that Friday night from the X-Bar ranch uh, and make it like an El Dorado themed thing, you know, and just kind of have fun with it that way. Maybe even have Stan Metter himself come and stand behind me and, and while I'm in the lodge, you know, and, and come and say a few words for you guys and stuff like that. I think that'd be super fun. Um, yeah. So be on the lookout for that. That'll be next. Well, next month, second Friday, um, which will be, I think it's like two days or three days right before um, El Dorado starts officially. So it's technically El Dorado, but y'all get what I'm saying. I think it'll be, I think it'll be fun. And, it looks like uh, Lonnie likes the idea. I think Lonnie will probably be out there anyway. I bet you. I bet you fifty bucks. Lonnie will be right there on the lodge field with us. Um, and I can I can almost assume that Eddie will be there too. And uh, you know maybe even Howard if we get lucky. Who knows? But um, <laughs> that's the idea. I want to float to you guys. Good. Right? Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll get y'all out there soon. Um, but that's that's the idea anyway. So maybe that'll work. Um, and that's where we'll that's where we'll call it an evening. I think we had a pretty successful evening uh, on another Friday edition. We're already through September, guys. The next meeting will be October, oh, no. and then November and December. And guess what? It's twenty twenty one. It's like you know, this year's been pretty crazy, but it has gone by fast. So I guess that's uh, that's a good thing. Lonnie says, "Yep, I'll be there." <laughs> in his in his normal little spot, I guess, because he stole he stole the camper spot that Howard and them used to have. So that's the way it goes. Yeah, uh, yeah, you have a spot, Lonnie. <laughs> he he wants it back now. No, <laughs> um, so we'll go around the table here for last minute comments, and then we'll close her out. Eddie, Mister Trevino, you got anything? Any parting words of wisdom for us, my man? Hey, the weather's getting cooler, the nights are getting longer, and uh, it's going to start getting really clear in the evenings and overnight as the humidity drops during the season. Uh, get out there and look up. I love it. Simple and very effective and exactly what I would suggest too. Very good, Eddie. Thank you. Mr. Howard Miner, 
Any uh, yeah. any parting words of wisdom? Wisdom, wisdom. Wow, that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, uh, uh, I think it was an excellent meeting. Well, you got everything going good, and um, and so I was wondering if um, maybe we can off just officers and stuff. Maybe not have to be on the deal, but we can invite some of our people like Spencer Pratt that's on the screen right now and um, yeah. have him on or Lonnie and this type of thing. So get a few more people um, interested in doing this because it's a lot of fun, actually. Definitely yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and uh, we uh, we had to, you know, Eddie and I were like, we have to get Howard on. We just have to do this. Yeah. Um, and so, um, this is your second time to appear on the, on the online version of our meetings, which is fantastic, but yeah, Lonnie, reach out to me and let's get you on. I know, I know Lonnie has good internet. He's just down the road from me. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure he has a webcam. I think, I think most of us do nowadays. There's a webcam somewhere. Um, but yeah, we got to get Lonnie on here for sure. So he can drop yes. some knowledge bombs for us. Uh, George Lutch says, Get the dew straps ready. You know, that's sometimes an issue at El Dorado, but sometimes it's not. It's just, you know, flip of a coin there. But uh, we appreciate you watching, George. And uh, Steve says, wow, this 2.5 hours really flew by. Thanks, guys. Well, thank you, Steve. And you helped you helped that with your comments and uh, participation and all that. And Spencer put a star emoji. I, don't, I guess that's what that is. Uh, he says, I have a face for radio, which is great because this is <laughs> – Kind of radio, except it's not being broadcast on the radio, I guess. But the, <laughs> we can make it work, Spencer. But uh, I really appreciate you guys. Eddie, thank you so much for joining us. Howard, uh, be sure to tell Jane thank you so much for, for hanging out with us for a little bit. Uh, such an honor to have you guys uh, join us for one of these. And, um, uh, you know, any anybody in our club, anybody in the Astronomical Society of Southeast Texas, if you want to be on, uh, just shoot me an email. Uh, let's get you on because I get tired of being the person that's just up here, you know, just yammering for hours. You know, that's why I like to turn it over to these guys, let them do uh, a little bit of the talking so that I can let my voice rest a little bit, you know, right? So, um, but uh, yeah, George says, I'm going to miss everyone at El Dorado. George is a, is a El Dorado regular, but uh, due to this year, he's not going to be able to make it, but he'll be back in 2021. I bet you. I bet you. Uh, but he says elbow cough, <clears throat> uh, clear skies, everyone. <laughs> I like it. That cough to your elbow. That's the way we do it these days. But, um, I appreciate all y'all watching again. We are the astronomical society of Southeast Texas. We are a 501 C three, uh, group here in Beaumont, Texas. If you look, make a donation or you want to join us, we'd love to have you. You don't have to be a local to join us. Uh, you'll get the newsletter. You'll get the reflector. You'll get all kinds of, uh, club perks and you'll know when we're going to be doing these meetings because we'll let you know and you can come join us we'd love to have it um that's it i think that's it for us though uh because we've got some stuff to do i know eddie's gonna get to bed so howard's got to wake up early in the morning to catch that sunrise with coffee for sure <laughs> so uh right. we're gonna we're gonna get on with our evenings here but again i want to say a thank you to all uh of everybody that was watching us hanging out with us and again it's, it is september 11th guys until midnight so keep keep that in your thoughts Remember how great it is to be an American, how great this country is, whether you believe in this or that or what side of the political spectrum you're on. This country is great, uh, and we are a fantastic group of people, and only if we all work together will it become better or greater. So let's work together, and let's, let's have some unity, and remember who we are because I think that's important. So Great, great message, Will. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate yep. that. Uh, I work hard on my messages. No. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna go to the back office and uh, congratulate each other on a great broadcast. Y'all go and have a great evening wherever y'all may be at on the planet. Lori Cell, have a great evening. We appreciate all of y'all. We will see y'all next month right here on Facebook or YouTube or one of them from the El Dorado Star Party. And uh, that's all we have, guys. Again. Good night, everyone. Y'all be good. good night. Peace out. Good night. Good night from Jane. <laughs> Perfect.